Hey everybody and welcome to part 5 of our Lives of the Apostles series where we are walking through the lives of the 12 apostles from three different perspectives. First, we're talking about their fictional storylines very briefly from the TV show The Chosen and then we're taking a deep dive into what we know about their lives from the text of scripture and then thirdly, we're talking about what we might or might not know about their lives from the early traditions that developed in the early church after the closing of the canon of scripture. So far, we have talked about three other apostles we did two videos on the apostle peter we did one video on his brother andrew and then we did one video on big james also known as james the elder who is the brother of the subject of today's video the apostle john i will warn you ahead of time we're not going to cover all about john in today's video and believe it or not we're not going to cover all about him in the next video either yes i know i told you with simon peter that i thought he might be the only person to have a two-parter and technically that's true because with John, we've got a lot to cover and it's actually going to be a three part video. I don't know if each of those videos is going to be the same length as the other ones have been, but with John, there's just so, so much to cover that I want to talk about. And there's a few other loose ends that I want to address with John that we didn't cover with the other three that I just had to break it into three parts. And so this is going to be actually a three week series on the Apostle John. I've already done all the research and I just thought that it'd be best if I actually split these up in that way. Uh, but I hope that you're really excited for this. And I actually wanted to do things a little bit differently before we got started today and started talking about The Chosen. I actually wanted to just take a moment and pray before we went into this video, just to make sure that we are in the right kind of headspace and we have the right focus. Uh, before we go into these videos. And so if you don't mind, uh, I know it's kind of different just praying over the uh, through this video, but I thought that might be kind of useful before we actually started talking about these characters. So let's bow our heads or, I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to close your eyes. You can just talk to God, but dear Lord, uh, I want to thank you for allowing us the opportunity to just sit here and learn about you, learn about scripture, learn about the people that you chose to lay the foundation for your church. There are some people in the world who do not even have the freedom to talk about you freely. Uh, and so we just want to praise you for the privilege you've given us to be able to just sit here in the luxury of our own homes or wherever we're at and to learn about you, God. That's amazing. And that's a gift of grace right there. And we thank you for that. Let us not take that for granted. But also as we dive into the lives of these apostles, I pray that this won't just purely be an informational trek or journey for us, God, but that you'll use the information that we learn and that we glean here and that you'll ultimately use it to help us fall more in love with you and to help desire you more, God. And that ultimately the information we learn will guide us into worship because if we're just gaining information for the sake of information, we'll get puffed up with knowledge and that's no good. Uh, instead, God, take this information and help us fall in love with you more and desire to live for you more. And may we learn from these apostles and their lives live for you. May we also learn how to live for you in, a same, in the same manner, God, willing to endure the same things that they endured, willing to follow you in the same way that they followed you, to walk in your dust, to sit at your feet, to read the Bible as you wrote it and as you meant it to be read. So God, just keep our minds focused on you. Let us set aside all distractions. Let us set aside all worldly things right now. And let's just set our hearts on the God who created the universe and the God who sent his son to save us, though we were undeserving of it. We love you, God. We thank you so much for everything that you have done, you are doing, and you will do. And I pray that you'll make us part of the solution that this world so desperately, desperately needs. Uh, we thank you, God, for everything you are. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, so now that that's done with, uh, let's get started by talking very briefly about the Apostle John's fictional storyline in The Chosen. So we're introduced to John and his brother James while they're in the Hammer, which is a tavern in Capernaum where their friend Simon, future name Simon Peter, is buying them drinks. This is in season one, episode two. Little do they know it, but Simon is actually buttering them and their fellow merchants up because he is planning on handing them over to the Romans for fishing on the Sabbath, which they've been doing to avoid paying taxes. Just when Simon's planning on betraying them to the Romans, though, he encounters a fishing bobber belonging to their father Zebedee and ends up having a last-minute change of heart. Simon reveals what he'd been planning to do, and all of them, James, John, and Zebedee, are all furious about this. And despite his apologies, John and James stand up and prepare to leave. The father Zebedee is a bit wealthier than Simon and Andrew, with many fishermen in their employ, and so Simon tries to use this to encourage them to help him out, despite what he was trying to do to them. 
Despite this, however, Zebedee's furious by Simon's betrayal and refuses to help Simon out, telling him that he put himself in this situation and he can get himself out. It turns out that Zebedee and his kids are pretty cool people though, because they still end up accompanying Andrew in the middle of the night to help Simon with one last ditch effort to catch fish before his deadline with the Romans the following day. However, despite fishing all night, they don't catch anything, but everything is suddenly fixed when a guy named Jesus miraculously provides a bunch of fish that fill their nets and settle Simon's debts. When Jesus calls John and James to follow him, along with Simon and Andrew, they get Zebedee's blessing and they go with him. Meeting up with the other disciples, they accompany Jesus up to a wedding in Cana where Jesus turns water into wine. While traveling back to Capernaum after the wedding, the group comes across a leper, and John immediately draws out his knife to fend him off. Jesus tells them that everything's fine, however, and calmly walks over to the man and heals him of his disease, startling all of them and filling them with awe. They return to Capernaum, where the brothers reunite with their mother and father, who host Jesus as he begins to teach. As the crowd begins to grow, Simon pulls John aside to voice his concern over keeping Jesus safe. John tells Simon he needs to calm down and encourages him to trust in Jesus, telling him everything will be all right. After the Romans start charging the house at the instigation of the Pharisees, they escape out the back of Zebedee's house as Zebedee bars the front door. The next morning, John warns Jesus that if he keeps doing the things he's doing, he won't be able to stay in the same place for long. He asks if Jesus is fine jumping from town to town, and Jesus tells him that all he wants to do is the will of his Father and spread the message of salvation. He also takes time to teach John a valuable lesson, always leave firewood for the next weary traveler. That evening, Jesus meets with a prominent Pharisee named Nicodemus, taking John and Andrew along with them to keep watch from the outside. As Andrew marvels at the amazing teachings they're hearing pour from Jesus' mouth, John shushes him harshly, scribbling down notes in the notebook that he brought with him. They end up making their way to Samaria, where Jesus reveals himself as the Messiah to Photina, a woman he met at Jacob's well. The group enters the town with their mission before them and trouble in their wake. Season 2 kicks off with a flash forward to about 15 years in the future, where all the disciples have gathered together in Jerusalem. They're mourning the death of John's brother, Big James. John recognizes that James won't be the last of them to be killed, and so he takes advantage of the fact that they're all in the same location to start collecting testimonies so that he can compile a written composition of Jesus' life, which will preserve his work and teachings long after they're gone. He speaks with various disciples and ultimately with Mary, to whom he discloses that he doesn't know where to begin Jesus' story. When the thunder cracks outside, Mary remarks how it always reminds her of James and John. Back in the present day, James and John are sowing a field outside of Sychar. They're busy teasing one another and trying to determine why Jesus appointed them to the task and not the other disciples, ultimately coming to the conclusion that they're the hardest workers and that Jesus likes them the best. That evening, Jesus thanks them for the hard work and asks them to recount to the others all that they did, and the following morning, the group gathers in the marketplace as James and John dish out instructions given to them by Jesus, assigning tasks to everybody in preparation for the meal that they're planning for that night. This brings them into conflict with Simon, who doesn't exactly like the idea of others being placed in authority above him, but they end up assigning him the task of purchasing wine as they get off the streets to avoid those nasty and rascally Samaritans. Later that day, Jesus compliments their work on the field, but James and John are shocked to find out that all their work was for a Samaritan named Melek, a crippled man who couldn't have done the work for himself. They don't like this very much, but they end up eating dinner at Melek's house anyways before spending the night at Fotina's husband's house. The next morning, James and John are surprised to learn that Jesus has healed Melek despite not being in his presence, and Jesus reassures them that one day they'll be able to do similar things. After reciting their morning prayers, everyone gathers for breakfast, where James and John begin detailing the schedule that they've begun to write up for the coming weeks. A dispute breaks out about whether or not James and John should be in charge, causing John to storm out with James on his heels. They find Jesus to voice their complaints when suddenly a group of Samaritans start spitting and casting stones at them as they pass by. The already emotional James and John go totally bonkers, and they tell Jesus that nobody should treat him in such a manner, begging him to allow them to call down fire from heaven to consume the Samaritans. 
Jesus harshly rebukes them, telling them that the reason he appointed them to sow the field is because he wanted them to learn that his message was for all people and that no one, neither Jew nor Samaritan, is worthy of what he has to offer. They apologize, and he gives them the nickname Sons of Thunder, a nickname which is part compliment, part insult. As Jesus is preparing to preach in the Samaritan synagogue, he calls in John, seeking counsel in which book he should preach from. John feels unworthy for the task, to which Jesus says, who's worthy of anything? John says that Jesus is worthy, but that no man is, to which Jesus affirms that he is indeed a man. John knows that this can't be the whole story, to which Jesus turns to him and reveals his full identity. I am who I am. Realizing that he is standing in the presence of God, John is at a loss of words, but ultimately manages to suggest to Jesus that starting at the beginning of the story would probably be the best place to begin. As Jesus reads the opening words of Genesis, a teary-eyed John listens in amazement, hearing God read his words aloud. Fifteen years in the future, we see that John at last has discovered where to begin Jesus' story. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Back in our present timeline, as the group travels through the Bashan towards Syria, John, James, Simon, and Thomas encounter a man named Philip, a former disciple of John the Baptist who quickly makes himself part of the group. James and John go ahead of the group into Syria, and whenever the group finally arrives in Syria, the group truly begins to bond with one another, voicing their various frustrations and confusions as Jesus is off healing the multitudes that come to him. John mentions how he always longed to see the Messiah, but never imagined he would be as close to him as he is. He also voices his confusion, because James had always taught him that the Messiah would come at a time when all was holy. Later that evening, the group is gathered around a fire discussing their struggles as Jewish people and their frustrations under the Roman occupation. When Simon raises the issue of Matthew's former days as a tax collector, James and John come to Matthew's defense, not because he's innocent, but because Simon isn't exactly guiltless either. They remind him of how he worked with the Romans for a time as well, working against them, planning on handing them over. Simon gives a half-hearted apology, but tensions continue to rise until all of them stand up, but are ultimately silenced by Jesus, who staggers into the scene, exhausted after a long day's work. They all stand there silently around the fire, convicted by their own immaturity. Weeks later, after celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles near Jerusalem, John and Simon warn Jesus about Shimuel, who is now in Jerusalem speaking of Jesus as a false prophet. The next day, John, Simon, and Matthew accompany Jesus into the city, where they get to witness Jesus heal a lame man named Jesse by the pool of Bethesda. Seeing this, John pulls out his journal and immediately starts scribbling. Jesus knows that this will cause further trouble with the religious leaders, but he tells them that sometimes you have to stir up the water. A little while later, while camped near Jericho, James and John are watching the newcomer, Simon the Zealot, as he does his early morning training. They contemplate why Jesus picked the various people who found themselves amongst their group, trying to figure out what role each person has to play. John admits that there was a time when he considered joining the Zealots, but is ultimately glad that he joined Jesus, and even jokes that their mother would probably be thrilled to figure out that Jesus himself had given them a title. When James admits that he is pretty confused about everything Jesus is doing, John admits that he feels the same, and that he thinks it will be a long time before anyone truly understands. Later on, the group receives word that John the Baptist has been taken into custody, and the brothers deliver the news to Simon before the group leaves to a synagogue, where Jesus heals a man's withered hand and causes yet another stir with the religious leaders. When the group gets back to Galilee, Jesus instructs Simon... Andrew, James, and John to go fishing, but after winning a stone-throwing contest against Simon and Andrew, James and John skirt out on their duty and return to the rest of the group so that they can hear what all Jesus has to tell them in regard to his upcoming sermon. When a group of Romans come to apprehend Jesus, James and John come to his defense, but in compliance with the Romans' orders, Jesus tells them to lay down their knives and take a few steps back. In the emotional confusion that follows, John ends up lashing out against both Marys, but everything ends up being resolved whenever Jesus returns to them unscathed and unharmed. After Jesus rebukes them for not trusting him, John requests that Jesus teach them how to pray, just as John the Baptist used to teach his disciples to pray. And Jesus complies. Tensions continue to rise as Jesus' big sermon approaches, with John accusing Simon the Zealot's strict fitness regimen as a disgusting form of Hellenism, despite having voiced his former desire to join the Zealots to James not too long earlier. 
When the big day finally arrives, John is directing the crowd when he enjoys a brief reunion with his father Zebedee and his mother Salome before returning backstage to meet up with Jesus. John stands at Jesus' right hand as he makes his way up the steps to preach his sermon on the mount. Alrighty, well, now that we've talked about John and the Chosen, it's time to get into the meat of my favorite parts of these videos, which is talking about this apostle according to the text of Scripture. I am going to pull up my PowerPoint here, and we are going to get started right off the bat. Uh, but one thing that's going to be a little bit different about talking about the Apostle John is that we're not going to start off with his biographical information for the reason I'm about to explain. Because for a lot of the other apostles, we can just jump right in and start talking about what we know with certainty about them. But with the Apostle John, there's actually something we have to address before that because there's a question that will help inform some of the stuff we know. And that question is this. Who is the beloved disciple, a.k.a. the disciple whom Jesus loved? There's a lot of people who associate the Apostle John with the beloved disciple that's mentioned in the Gospel of John, and we have to determine whether or not he is that disciple before we can move forward, because if he is, that's going to shape, it's going to shape a lot of what we believe about this character and what we believe about the historical Apostle John. And so we really have to answer this question before we can move on at all, because if we don't know this, we're just going to make a lot of assumptions and stuff. Spoiler alert, I will tell you right here and right now, I do believe that the beloved disciple, that the disciple whom Jesus loved, is the Apostle John. And over the course of the next few minutes, I'm going to explain why I believe we have good reason to believe that. And then, after we kind of cover this, then we'll move on to the actual biographical information. But let's talk about this. Who is the beloved disciple? First off, let's just look at the claims of Scripture. Uh, according to the Bible, the beloved disciple is the same person who wrote the Gospel of John. In John chapter 21, verses 20 and 24, this is at the very end of the Gospel of John, literally the last chapter, the final few verses, we read this, that Peter, this is in a conversation that we've talked about in previous videos, whenever Peter is being reinstated by Jesus, uh, he, uh, basically Jesus prophesies to him that he will one day die for his faith. And we read that Peter turns and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? This is in John chapter 13. So basically Peter turns and he sees this disciple walking behind them. And Peter's going to ask Jesus about this disciple. But then a few verses later, after they talk about this guy, we read this in verse 24. This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. So right here, we have Peter turning to the beloved disciple, and they see him walking. And then a few verses later, it says that this disciple, the beloved disciple, is the one who is currently bearing witness about these things, and he's the one who actually wrote this stuff down. That tells us that whoever this beloved disciple is, he's the one who wrote the fourth gospel. Now we have to move out to tradition. According to tradition, John is the author of the fourth gospel. And we actually have a few different reasons to believe this. First off, we have this guy named Irenaeus. And what you need to know about Irenaeus is that he is actually a person who lived during the second century from about AD 130 to about AD 200. So pretty much from the early to mid... For, uh, early to mid 2nd century to the very end of the 2nd century. Uh, he lived during that time, uh, during that time, and Irenaeus was a disciple of a guy named Polycarp, who was in turn a disciple of the Apostle John. So in a way, if we're thinking about this in terms of lineage, Irenaeus is like the grandchild of the Apostle John, the grandchild of faith at least, right? So John discipled Polycarp, Polycarp discipled Irenaeus, and Irenaeus in the 2nd century, about 100 years after all this stuff would have happened, he says this, afterwards, John the disciple of the Lord, who also had leaned upon his breast, did himself publish a gospel during his resident at uh, during his residence at Ephesus in Asia. Right? So he specifies right here that John wrote a gospel, and John is to be identified as the person who leaned upon Jesus' breast, which is the person who is identified as the uh, beloved disciple in John chapter 21. And so right here, Irenaeus in the second century, he's identifying John as the author of the fourth gospel and the author of, or he's identifying him as the author of the fourth gospel and as the beloved disciple. So all these people are the same person. And also fairly early on in our manuscript evidence, we do have the title according to John, Kata Ioannis, uh, that appears at the top of the manuscripts for the gospel of John. So that tells us Early on, it was attributed to John. 
But let's look on. Uh, there's this guy named Theophilus of Antioch, also writing in the 2nd century. And in his letter to Autolycus, uh, he says this, The holy writings teach us, and all the inspired men, one of whom John says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. So Theophilus is writing right here, and he says that in the inspired writings, which we would call Scripture, the Old and New Testament, uh, in these inspired writings, there's this one person named John, the Apostle John, who wrote these words, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Well, if you flip your Bible open to the Gospel of John, the very first verse will say, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Therefore, Theophilus is saying that John wrote the fourth Gospel which would also identify him as the beloved disciple according to scripture. We got one more we're going to quote here. Uh, actually, we're not going to quote him because I didn't do that. I forgot what I had in this. Uh, but we do have other references here uh, in the Muratorian canon, the Muratorian canon. That's also dating to the second century. That is our earliest list of the New Testament books. That, uh, that canon, that fragment, it actually lists the Apostle John as the author of the fourth gospel. And then Tertullian, writing in the third century uh, in his book called Against Marcion, and Marcion was a heretic, uh, Tertullian also identifies John as the author of the fourth gospel. Uh, and according to John MacArthur in his uh, commentary on the gospel of John, he says that no manuscript has ever been found that attributes John's gospel to anyone other than him. Uh, there has been this movement in recent scholarship to challenge this, but that's more of a, co a modern development with that seems to have more likely developed from the rise in skepticism. And also, if I'm being entirely honest, it seems that it's arisen from some snobbery and some pride that people have where they think that they know more about these ancient manuscripts than the people who were around at that time do. Uh, but every early tradition we have attributes the fourth gospel to the Apostle John, and it identifies him as the beloved disciple who wrote this stuff in the Bible. That's all our early manuscript. All the questioning of this authorship, that's a rise of modern scholarship. And so right then and there, we already have good evidence for this, but that's external evidence, right? I mean, we have the quote from the Bible, but then we have external evidence that affirms this. Now what I want to do is I want to look into the Gospel of John to see if from the text of the Gospel itself, if we can determine who this author is. And so let's ask another question. Is John the beloved disciple? As you can see, I accidentally included this here. That should have been fading in in the future, but uh, you know, nobody's perfect. And so there you go. We'll get to that one in a second, but we're gonna start going in order from the top. And we're just going to be looking to things that we can perceive about this author from the gospel itself. The first thing that we can perceive is that the author is not named in the gospel. He never provides his name other than to describe himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's why we call him the beloved disciple nowadays. Uh, every time, I think it's five different references here, right? 1323, 1926, 22, 21, 7, and 21, 20. In those five instances, we have the author of the gospel identifying himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, but he never once names himself. This is interesting, and this might kind of point us towards the Gospel of John. All these are going to build on one another, and they're going to narrow each other down, right? But this one right here, first and foremost, it begins to narrow things down because if you look at the Synoptic Gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, if you look at those three Gospels, the Apostle John is a main character in those books, right? I mean, of the innermost apostles, you've got Peter, you've got James, and you've got John who are in the innermost three. And I believe in the Synoptic Gospels, you have John being mentioned around 20 times, but he's not mentioned a single time in this gospel. And that's unique because the author never names himself and John is never mentioned. And so there's different ways this could be unique. Firstly, because of the important role played by disciples in the gospel of John. Uh, you see that we actually learn a lot more about the apostles, uh, the inner 12. We learn a lot more about them in the Gospel of John. I mean, Philip and Andrew, we learn a lot more about them in the Gospel of John more than we learn from the synoptics. We learn more about Thomas in the Gospel of John than we learn from the synoptics. And so when you look at the Gospel of John by itself, there's this heavy emphasis placed on the disciples. Yet, interestingly, John is not mentioned. And that brings the other side of this thing, right? John is so prevalent in the Synoptic Gospels, yet he's missing from the Gospel of John. And so when you hold these two things side by side, it already begins to point in the direction that maybe the Apostle John is somewhat related to this because why would you not mention him? We do have good tradition to believe that the Apostle John was the longest lived disciple. We'll talk about that in, the, uh, in a few videos. But 
it's very odd that John is not mentioned by name in this gospel, and that might give us reason to believe that he is the author behind this gospel. But if that's not enough for you, we've got more points. Secondly, we can tell that this author, whoever he is, he is at least Jewish. He displays an in-depth personal knowledge of Jewish religion, custom, and culture. We can tell that he's very familiar with the Old Testament because although the author doesn't directly cite the Old Testament as frequently as the synoptics do, he alludes to it more often than any of the others and directly insists on a correlation between Jesus and the key figures and institutions featured in the Old Testament. For instance, throughout the Gospel of John, like I said, he doesn't quote from the Old Testament as much as like Matthew does, for instance, but he does allude to things which in a way actually displays a more in-depth knowledge because he's not having to directly quote it. His worldview is so built on the Jewish religion that he just alludes to stuff where Jesus, he's presented as kind of replacing the temple. Jesus is the greater Moses. He's the greater Abraham. He's greater than all these different things according to the Jewish religion. And uh, we have, you know, in John chapter three, whenever Jesus, right before he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, right before he says that, he says this, just as Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up. So he's alluding to this story in the book of Numbers where there's this bronze serpent that Moses lifts up. And so it shows that the author was at least Jewish to the extent that he was so familiar with Jewish customs that he could just offhandedly reference them. We also see within the text of John that his quotations are closer in form to Hebrew or Aramaic than they are to Greek. So the text of the Gospel of John is written in Greek, kind of like all the other books of the New Testament. Um, the Old Testament is predominantly written in Hebrew with a little bit of Aramaic. Uh, but then the New Testament is entirely written in Greek. But interestingly about the Gospel of John is that there's certain phrases that seem more Hebrew or Aramaic in structure. And if you don't know anything about multiple languages, that won't mean a lot to you. But there are distinctions, long story short, there are distinctions between languages and Greek languages, uh, a more Western language versus a Eastern language like Hebrew or Aramaic. They have a lot of structural differences because they would have constructed their sentences differently. They had different emphases. They, uh, they just have different focuses. Uh, our language in English is a lot more akin to Greek than it is to Hebrew or Aramaic. That's why it's harder to learn Hebrew or Aramaic for an English speaking um, person. So the Gospel of John, despite being written in Greek, it's a lot closer to Hebrew or Aramaic than any of the other Gospels are. Uh, so it shows that this author might have been Jewish. Uh, we also see that his familiarity with people, time, numbers, and minute details suggests that he was present at the events that he accounts, which will come back to us whenever we get to number five down here, which I unfortunately already revealed to you that he's an eyewitness. But... We'll put that one on the back burner and we'll come to that again in the future. Thirdly, this author calls John the Baptist, John. Uh, this one might not immediately uh, ring, send off any red flags in your head, but it's very, very interesting. Unlike the other evangelists, he never feels the need to qualify which John he refers to. There are two Johns who are mentioned in the Gospel of John, neither of which are the Apostle John. We have first off, uh, John, the father of Simon and Andrew, right? So Jesus turns to Simon and says, Simon, son of John. But other than that, there's a few references, I believe, to uh, John, the father of Simon and Andrew. All the other references to John are to a person named John the Baptist, right? And this is how he's identified in the Synoptic Gospels. He's called John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. Uh, usually people call him John the Baptizer if they are not Baptist and they don't want people to get confused that, uh, you know, they're Baptist, <laughs> that John the Baptist was a Baptist. Uh, but usually in the Synoptic Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John the Baptist is identified as John the Baptist. In the Gospel of John, he's never called this, not a single time. He's always just called John. You go to John chapter 1, it says there was a man who came from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to the light. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. And every time you see John the Baptist being mentioned, he is only called John. This makes a lot of sense if the author's name is John. And I can explain it in this way. My name is David, and I've got a bunch of people in my family named David, right? I mean, I've got a cousin named David. I've got an uncle named David. My dad, while he was alive, his name was David. I've got another uncle named David. So there are what? That was five Davids already in my family. There's me, my dad, two uncles, and a cousin. That's five Davids in my family. And so whenever we have big get-togethers, people are always having to call us different names. My name in my family is David Lee. It's my first and middle name. That's how they identify me. My dad, he was just 
David because he was Big David, you know? So my dad was David. I was David Lee. I've got a cousin. We've got a name for him. Got two uncles. we got names for them. One of them is Dave, right? We have different ways to signify these different people. But whenever I'm talking to my cousin, I don't have to call him by that name that everybody else calls him. I just call him David because to me, I don't need to distinguish between two different Davids because I am the other David. I know I'm not talking about myself, so I can call him that. Whenever I'm talking to my, well, I guess I would call my uncle David, my uncle David. But if two people with the same name are talking to one another, they don't have to distinguish between their names because they are the two distinguishing people, right? Does that make sense? I hope that I'm articulating that correctly but that's basically what we have here with John and John the Baptist because if John is talking about John the Baptist he doesn't need to call him John the Baptist because the only person he'd be distinguishing John the Baptist from is himself from John's perspective John the Baptist is simply John from everybody else's perspective you've got John the Baptist and you've got John son of Zebedee from John's perspective you don't need to make that distinguishing factor this is enhanced by the fact that whenever you look into the Gospel of John he pays a lot of attention to titles of other people. For instance, he calls Thomas, Thomas Didymus, which Thomas and Didymus mean the same things, but he's clarifying with extra detail that Thomas was also called Didymus. He also references Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. So the other gospels call Judas, Judas Iscariot. John doesn't do that. He calls, or sorry, the author of the fourth gospel. The author of the fourth gospel does not do that. Instead, he references Judas as Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, because he's being extra specific because there's another Judas in the group. He also references Caiaphas, who was the high priest at that time period. And so the gospel of John gives a lot of details about the characters involved. But for some reason with John the Baptist, he never calls him the Baptist. He always just calls him John. This might give us clues that the author was also named John. We don't yet know if he's John the Apostle. It could be another John for all we know. But it does give us the idea that maybe a guy named John was behind this, hence why he only calls John the Baptist John. Fourthly, the author is a resident of Israel. And we know this because he displays a detailed knowledge of places only residents of first century Israel would know about. One of the first, uh, one of the, um, first things that comes to my mind is whenever you go into the gospel of John, he references these pools. And I believe it's the pool of Bethesda in John chapter five. That chapter, I could be wrong here, but I believe it's in that chapter where he references that the pool of Bethesda had like five colonnades or something like that. For the longest time, people did not know what this place was until archeological evidence discovered there was a pool in Jerusalem with five colonnades. And that's what the author of John is referencing. So this person, whoever's writing this, he is displaying a knowledge about the land of Jeru uh, Israel and specifically of Jerusalem that would have only been available to somebody living in the first century Israel at that time period. Right, And so he demonstrates familiarity with local areas of both Galilee and Judea and even mentions some locations not mentioned in the synoptics. He goes into detail on places that are totally absent from the synoptics, yet he's very precise about where they are. He mentions another town called Bethany, which is across the Jordan. Right, so it's, it's distinguishing it from another Bethany that we mentioned that we hear about in the other Gospels. So he's keenly aware that the fact that there's two different Bethanies in Israel at this time period, and he takes the time to distinguish one from the other. Fifth, as you've already seen this down here this entire time, I'm kind of embarrassed that I didn't edit this correctly. Uh, fifthly, we know that the author is an eyewitness, and that's because he provides specific details that only an eyewitness would know. Uh, even when the details aren't essential to the story, he includes these, and he includes many details that are unique to his gospel. Uh, in chapter 21, verse 24, the one we read earlier, we actually have the author claiming to be an eyewitness, right? He says that he is the beloved disciple who witnessed these things. And we actually know from the gospel itself that eyewitness testimony is very, very crucial throughout the entire book. Basically, the entire book, the way the Gospel of John is structured, is it's a series of testimonies. We start off with the testimony of John the Baptist. Then we get to the testimony of Jesus' signs and his miracles. And we get all these testimonies throughout the whole thing. And it's because there are certain things that testify about who Jesus was. The author at the end of the book says that the reason you can trust this is because he himself was an eyewitness. And so he identifies himself as that. And the text of scripture actually backs this up. Internal details bear witness to the fact that the author had to have had some level of personal insight to the events unfolding. He is intimately aware of time, people, minute, uh, minute details, and all of that stuff, which is best explained by him actually being an eyewitness 
at these events. There are times whenever he says that the people sat down on the green grass. There are times when it says that Jesus called people and it was approximately this hour. Those are specific details that would only be known by an eyewitness. And so once again, we get to see that this guy might have been very involved with Jesus' life. And so we still got more. We still have more evidence that can narrow this down to John. But let's recap this really quickly. First off, we know that the author is not named in the gospel, so that does not help us out. That's consistent with all the gospels. Matthew does not identify the author as Matthew. Mark does not identify the author as Mark. Luke does not identify the author as Luke. John doesn't identify the author as John. That's consistent with the gospels. So that's where we're starting at. We don't know who this is. But we do know that he's Jewish. We know that he calls John the Baptist John, which might suggest that his name is also John. It doesn't guarantee it, but it might suggest that. We know that he's a resident of Israel, and we know that he's an eyewitness. So at the very least, we know that this guy is a Jewish man living in Israel who is an eyewitness to the stuff that Jesus did, and for some reason he didn't feel the need to identify John the Baptist as John the Baptist. He just called him John. Let's see if we can narrow this down even more. Because right now, this is still very broad. We just have somebody who is an eyewitness to Jesus' ministry. Let's go further. So, continuing on. First, we, we know that this guy, he was an apostle of Jesus. He was well enough acquainted with the Twelve to know both their thoughts and their feelings. We have instances wherever he is talking about the thoughts and the feelings being conveyed by these different apostles. That's very close, very intimate. Uh, there are times whenever we have, uh, like the verse we read earlier, where Peter is sharing this private conversation with Jesus, yet this guy's able to relay that information. And he even gets to know what Peter is feeling at different moments. That's interesting, because that tells us that he was well enough acquainted with the Twelve to know their feelings. But it goes beyond that. He was present at the Last Supper, which, if you go to Mark chapter 14, verse 17, in the Synoptic Gospels, tells us that only the 12 apostles were present at. The Gospel of John actually gives us the longest and the most detailed information about what took place at the Last Supper. John chapters 13 through 17 are considered the Last Supper discourse, and basically it takes us from the moment that Jesus and the disciples sit down for the Last Supper to the moment whenever they're getting up and they're walking all the way to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. According to the Gospel of Mark, the 12 apostles are the only ones who are present with Jesus here. Yet the Gospel of John, who the author claims to be an eyewitness, he gives us the most detailed information from that account. So that tells us he must have been an apostle. Then you go to John chapter 21, which we've referenced uh, earlier. He was one of the seven who was present while fishing in Galilee after the resurrection. So when you go to John chapter 20, that's whenever Jesus resurrects. And then John chapter 21 kind of serves like an epilogue to the Gospel of John. And in that section right there, we read that there were seven of the 12 apostles who got up and they went fishing. First off, we have it listed that there are Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, the sons of Zebedee, and two unnamed disciples, right? So there's seven people right there. Uh, Peter, Thomas, and Nathaniel, we know that it can't be them because the author does not name himself, and they are mentioned as people who are separate than the, um, than the author himself, right? So we know it's not Peter, we know it's not Thomas, we know that it's not Nathaniel. That leaves us with four options. It's either two unnamed disciples, or it's one of the sons of Zebedee. So we can narrow this down here, uh, really the three, because... James, the son of Zebedee, Big James, we talked about him in our last video, and we know that he died around A.D. 44. He would have been dead by the time this gospel would have been written, and so we know that he can't be the eyewitness who's writing this stuff down, because he would have already been dead and gone. So that leaves us with the Apostle John and two unnamed disciples who might or might not be the authors of this gospel. So we're down to three right now. Then, moving on to number seven... We know that the author is a close companion of Peter, and that's because many of his eyewitness accounts are shared alongside Peter. We referenced this uh, we referenced this story earlier, and we talked about it in the other videos that we've done, but there's this moment at the Last Supper whenever Peter leans over to the disciple whom Jesus loved and asks him to ask Jesus a question. Later on, we have instances whenever um, Peter turns back and another disciple with him, and they go into the courtyard to witness the trial of Christ. And then in chapter 21, we have this instance when Peter's being reinstated by Jesus and Peter turns and turns to the beloved disciple and says, what about this man? And so we know that whoever the author of the Gospel of John is, whether he's John or one of those two unnamed disciples, we know that he was a close 
companion of the apostle Peter. And this is interesting because whenever you look at the rest of the New Testament, Peter and John are often listed side by side, especially when you get to the book of Acts. Uh, really, if you go to the first few chapters of Acts, Peter and John are the main characters, and they're always witnessing alongside one another. It's kind of like they were buddies throughout ministry. So this might suggest to us, once again, that maybe this is the Apostle John, but we still can't guarantee because technically all of the 12 would have probably been good friends with one another. So we can't guarantee that, but we do have evidence from outside of scripture that suggests to us that John and Peter had some sort of special relationship, which is reinforced by the author of the Gospel of John. Lastly, but not least, we do see that the author beheld Christ's glory. He was present at the transfiguration, which was only witnessed by Peter, James, and John. Uh, this one is probably not the strongest argument, maybe, but if it is, it guarantees without a doubt that this is the Apostle John writing, but it really comes down to John chapter 1 verse 14. This is in the prologue of John. It tells us that whoever is writing this, it, it says that we beheld his glory. Uh, and people debate about what that phrase means. You can go to John chapter 1 for, verse 14 to see what I'm talking about. Um, there's debate about this, whether or not it just means that we beheld his glory as in we saw Jesus in the flesh, in which case it's just saying they're an eyewitness. But a lot of scholars think that this is specifically a reference to the transfiguration, which is this moment where literally Christ's glory was shown to three disciples whenever he shone bright like... Uh, he shone like a bright white light, like he was a brilliant white light, and he stood there and he talked with Moses and Elijah. It's this really crazy story that you can go read about in those uh, references right here. But if you go look at those, we see that only three apostles were present there, Peter, James, and John. As we've already mentioned, Peter, he can't be the beloved disciple because he's mentioned as in interacting with the beloved disciple multiple times throughout the Gospel of John. So we know it can't be Peter. And then we've already talked about how James, he would have already been dead at this point. That means that out of the three, only one remains, and that would be the Apostle John. And so if we were going to recap all these things, we know that the author of the Gospel of John, he's not named, but we know that he was a Jew. He only references John the Baptist as John. We know that he was a resident of Israel. We know that he was an eyewitness. We know that he was an apostle. That narrows us down to 12. We know that he was one of the seven who was present at that fishing event after the resurrection because we know that he was present shortly after that whenever Peter's looking and we know that he was an eyewitness to it. So that narrows it down to seven. And then he's a close companion of Peter, which narrows it down to a few of them because in the previous one, we narrowed it down to three. And then we know that, you know, James uh, and that John and Peter had somewhat of a close relationship so it seems to narrow it down to john and then if this reference in chapter 1 verse 14 is reference to the trans transfiguration the only person can be the apostle john and then this whole argument is reinforced by the fact that all external evidence suggests that the apostle john wrote the fourth gospel uh er like irenaeus Theophilus, all those people, they said that John wrote the fourth gospel. All early manuscript evidence tells us that John wrote the fourth gospel. And so taking the external evidence and the internal evidence and combining them together, we can conclude that the most likely candidate for authoring the fourth gospel is the apostle John. I'm sorry if that was very scholarly for y'all, and I'm, I apologize if I stumbled over my words there, but that's because there was a lot of information to go, cover, and uh, honestly, I just wanted to get through it because I want to get to the text of Scripture. That's my main passion in going through this stuff, but I did feel like this was an important question to address before we move on, because whether or not John wrote the fourth gospel... That's going to shape a lot of what we know about him because we can learn a lot of nuanced things about the author John or the, about the apostle John because of his authorship of the fourth gospel. Whenever we get to Matthew, we're going to be able to perceive certain things about Matthew's character based off of what he wrote in his gospel, right? And so the same thing applies with John. We can pick up things about him based off of the content that he included in the text of his gospel. And so this is an important question to ask. And some of y'all might not have even known there was a debate about it, but now you know there is, and now you know that really the debate is for no reason because all external and internal evidence seems to point to the fact that the Apostle John did write this gospel. There are always going to be people who disagree. There's even people that I highly respect who disagree with me, but I think that we have good reason to believe that the Apostle John wrote the fourth gospel and that he was the beloved disciple. And that all being said, 
I'm gonna take a swig of water and we can at long last move to the place where we would normally start our videos. All right, let's talk about John's biographical information. <laughs> I know, right? This is normally where we're starting the videos and we're finally getting there. And that's because I needed to preface all that stuff. First and foremost, we know that John's name is, surprise, John. This is the Greek word Yohannes, and it comes from the Hebrew word Yohanan, which means Yahweh is gracious. Yahweh, of course, being the name for the Hebrew God, the one true God, the God of Israel, Yahweh. Uh, you may also know him as Jehovah. Uh, you see the same thing actually there. Yahweh, see it turns into Jehovah. Y turns into J. Yohanan turns into John. Y turns into J. You see that there? That's how language has kind of worked over time. Uh, but yeah, so this means Yahweh is gracious, and John is one of four other people named John in the Bible. First off, you have John the Baptist, who we've talked a lot about already. We have John the Baptist, who was the forerunner and the cousin of Jesus. We have John, the father of Peter and Andrew. We have John Mark, the companion of both Peter and Paul. So technically, fun fact, there were actually two Gospel of Johns. There's the Gospel of the Apostle John and the Gospel of John Mark, but we usually just call him Mark, and so that's why that is. And then fourthly, there is John, who is a member of the high priest's family, who we mentioned, uh, who he, who we see mentioned one time in Acts chapter four, verses five and six. So if you go there, you will see that John. So there's four other people named John, but this person we're specifically talking about is the Apostle John, who is one of the pillars of the church that the Apostle Paul talks about in the book of Galatians. He is a big time leader of the church. And as we'll see, by the time we get to the end of these three videos, he will be the longest lived disciple. Most likely. I won't, I won't spoil that yet, but I guess I kind of already did. Uh, it does seem like that is the case about John. Uh, just a fun fact about the name John. It was the fifth most popular name at the time of Jesus in the first century Israel. This was the fifth most popular name just behind Judas, Lazarus, Joseph, and Simon. So Simon was the most popular name by far at this time period. That's why we have two Simons in the group of the 12. We have Simon Peter and Simon the Zealot shortly followed by uh, <clears throat> shortly followed by Joseph, such as the name of Jesus' father, or also Joseph of Arimathea. And then we have Lazarus, such as we have Lazarus, the friend of Jesus, and also Lazarus, a guy mentioned in one of Jesus' parables. And then we have fourthly Judas, and Judas, we've got two of those in the a group of the twelve as well. We've got Judas Iscariot, and Judas not Iscariot, as the Apostle John will reference him. And then we have John, right? And so John is the fifth most common name at this time period. And this is reinforced by the text of Scripture, where we see all those other names very common. And I've talked about this in previous videos. I think it was in the Apostle Peter video. But that's actually evidence for the Bible and for the genuineness of the early accounts, because it seems like they're actually recounting stories about genuine real people because the frequency that names show up in history according to archaeological evidence is consistent with the frequency that names appear in the Gospels. And that's actually something I would have never thought to look up, but it's actually a really cool argument for the truth of the Gospels. So his name is John, and you can know him as Yohanan, which is the Hebrew name. That's what people would have called him at that time period. And he's got two nicknames. One of them is Boanerges, uh, which we talked about this whenever we talked about Big James. Uh, we talked about the difficulty behind this name. And Mark translates this name as Sons of Thunder. There is some interesting stuff about this name. Like I said, go watch my Big James video if you want to see more about that. But they are called the Sons of Thunder. Him and his brother alike, Jesus gives them the name Sons of Thunder, Boanerges. And I'm not going to dive into all that... Um, grammatical or lexical stuff today in this video. Like I said, just go watch the Big James one. But I did want to read one quotation uh, that somebody was saying regarding what Jesus might have meant by this name, right? And so John P. Meyer, in his book, A Marginal Jew, it's actually a multi-volume work that's about the life of Christ, or the historical life of Christ. Uh, in John P. Meyer's book, he says this, What did Mark, or originally Jesus, mean by the name Sons of Thunder? Against suggestions are legion. Uh, the brothers spoke with a loud voice, or being disciples of John the Baptist, they witnessed the voice from heaven spoken in thunder at Jesus' baptism. More common is a psychological interpretation that James and John were impetuous, hot-tempered, or even, in the broad sense of the word, zealots. Right? So he's basically just listing out all the different possibilities for why Jesus might or might not have called them the sons of thunder. We really don't know for sure. 
I did reference in the video on Big James, I did talk about how there is this one incident with uh, James and John where they come to Jesus and they kind of get mad at him. Or they don't get mad at him, they get mad at Samaritans and they start asking Jesus if they can cast down fire on him. And most people think that that's probably where they got the name Sons of Thunder, where Jesus kind of meant it kind of like an insult, kind of like a compliment, uh, where it's like, okay, Sons of Thunder, y'all need to chill out, but he's also complimenting them on their zeal for him. Uh, and we actually, if you just watch the whole summary of The Chosen, that was in Season 2, Episode 1, where we actually see that event. Uh, and that's how they choose to represent this. Jesus sees this event where they get mad at the Samaritans, and he sees their zeal, and he sees their fiery temper, and he calls them the Sons of Thunder. That is a possibility, but in that quotation, I just wanted to show you different possibilities. It could be that they had loud voices. It could be that they were present at the baptism whenever the voice came, like thunder. Uh, there's various different things that people could think. We don't know for sure, but... That was their nickname, Sons of Thunder. John has another nickname. His brother had another nickname, Big James. He was known as James the Elder. John is known as the Beloved Disciple, right? This is what we just spent so much time talking about. But one thing we didn't talk about is how odd this nickname is. Uh, you might read the Gospel of John and you might think it's kind of weird that somebody would choose to call themselves the Beloved Disciple. You might be like, whoa, 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 that seems kind of arrogant, doesn't it? Because, I mean... If I went around being like, hey guys, I'm the disciple whom Jesus loved, nowadays that might sound like it has an air of conceit to it, right? It's like, oh, does he love you more than others? And some people will joke around like that. They kind of compare it to the one um, the one verse in, I think, I think it's in Numbers. It might be in Exodus. I think it's in Numbers where it says that Moses was one of the most meek men or he was the meekest man in all the earth or the most humble man in all the earth, and like, that's Moses writing this, right? <laughs> and so people joke around about that. It's kind of similar with the Gospel of John, where people are like, whoa, that's kind of weird that the author, John, would identify himself as the beloved disciple, the disciple whom Jesus loved. They find that kind of weird. But I think that D.A. Carson, in his commentary on the Gospel of John, he actually gives a very good explanation of what John more likely means by this, and that his reference to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's not actually supposed to be an arrogant title, but it's actually supposed to be the opposite. It's supposed to be a title that arises from humility. And this is what D.A. Carson says. Those who are most profoundly aware of their own sin and need, and who in consequence most deeply feel the wonders of the grace of God that has reached out and saved them, even them, are those who are most likely to talk about themselves as the object of God's love in Christ Jesus. If a son of thunder has become the apostle of love, small wonder he thinks of himself as the peculiar object of the love of Jesus. So this wouldn't be arrogance. This would actually be indebtedness to grace. This is John reflecting on the fact that Jesus loves him. Uh, it's not supposed to be, oh, I'm the disciple whom Jesus loved. It's like, I'm the disciple whom Jesus loved, right? It's, it's the... It's the amazement that God would love us. I was actually reading um, the letter, 1 John, which was also written by the Apostle John. I was reading that earlier today, and I was thinking about that one verse that says, what love the Father has lavished on us, that we would be called children of God. And a lot of the times we read that verse, and we make it almost like, oh, look how awesome I am that God would love me. But that's not what that verse is about. That verse is about saying, what love God has showed us. We don't deserve it. We couldn't earn it. We don't deserve any of this love. But God has chosen to love us nevertheless. And so it seems like that could be what John's going for when he calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. He is the son of thunder who had to be rebuked again and again and again by Jesus. And he's just amazed by the fact that Jesus loved him. Right? So I actually really like that. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think it lines up with the character of John that we see specifically throughout the gospel and throughout his three letters, right? In 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, I think we see that character also coming out, where we see this is a guy who is in indebted to the grace of God, and he just can't stop talking about love. That's another reason he's actually called the beloved disciple, is because, as we'll see later on when we start talking about his character, John is all about talking about love. He talks about love more than any other book of the Bible. Uh, so that's another reason why he's called the beloved disciple. It seems like that's a recurring theme throughout all of his work. Moving on, his father and his mother. We know for a fact that his father's name is Zebedee, and that's because throughout the Gospels it is stated that his father's name is Zebedee. Uh, James and John are referred to as the sons of Zebedee. We know that for a fact. His mother, 
Her name might or might not have been Salome, and if you've seen my Big James video, you'll know what I'm talking about. But in case you didn't see that, we are going to very briefly recap that argument in the slide that follows, and we're going to talk about whether or not we know for sure the identity of James and John's mother. But her name might or might not have been Salome. Moving on, we do know his, we do know that he has a sibling, or had a sibling, his name was James. We know him as a Big James, or James the Elder, and that person was the content of the last video that we did. Go watch that if you want to know all about Big James and everything we know about him. One thing I did want to say here, though, is that while John is the more prominent figure of the two in the book of Acts, there's only one scene in the Gospels where he appears without reference to his brother. Right? So whenever you get to the book of Acts, John and Peter really come to the forefront. And that might very well be because James dies so early on that they just don't mention his ministry, or maybe he just wasn't there for the significant moments that Peter and John were present for. In the Gospels, though, it actually seems like James might have been the more prevalent brother. He might have been the one who was actually out in the forefront even more than John. And there's only one story we get where John is mentioned apart from James. And so that's kind of interesting. Uh, we also seem uh, we have reason to think that maybe James was the older of the two brothers and John was the younger. But we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. When it comes to him having a spouse... We don't know. Uh, I believe tradition testifies to the fact that he never married, but uh, we just don't know for a fact, right? Uh, the Apostle Peter is the only one we know for a fact was married. It's always possible that the others were and it just wasn't mentioned, but we have no reason to think that he was married at this time period. His hometown might or might not have been Capernaum. This is Capernaum, the city of Nahum. Uh, but we don't know that either. I mentioned this in the Big James video. A lot of this stuff is going to be very similar to the Big James video here because uh, they grew up together. Uh, so they have a lot of the same biographical information. But we don't know where they grew up. A lot of sources, if you go look it up right now, they will tell you that James and John grew up in a town called Bethsaida. I don't know where they get that information. We know that Simon and Andrew grew up in Bethsaida and eventually moved to Capernaum. We don't know that about James and John, and to me it seems like a lot of people accidentally conflate those two stories to make them one and the same. But we actually have reason to think that that's not the case, because whenever you meet the disciple Philip, it says that he was from the town of Bethsaida, which is the town of Simon and Andrew. It doesn't say that Bethsaida is the town, the town of Simon, Andrew, James, and John. So we might have reason to think that maybe Simon and Andrew grew up in Bethsaida and moved to Capernaum, possibly to work for Zebedee, the father of James and John. Maybe. We don't know. Uh, but it does seem like maybe they grew up in Capernaum or they just grew up somewhere else that we don't know about. But since their father seemed to own a fishing business there, it's reasonable to think that they grew up in that area. Their place of residence was Capernaum. We know this because we actually see them living there in the Gospels. Education would be limited. This is, like I said, going to be the case with most of the disciples. Notice I said most, not all. Uh, but most of the disciples were probably very limited in their education. And with John, we know this Pretty much for a fact, because in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, we have this incident with Peter and John standing before the religious high council, and they are speaking boldly in the name of Jesus, and the people are amazed because they perceive that Peter and John are uneducated common men. And whenever it says uneducated, it's not saying they had no education whatsoever. It's saying that from the perspective of religious leaders, they had no education. So this is the equivalent of a pastor looking at somebody and saying that they did not have seminary training, right? So it's not that they weren't educated at all. They just weren't educated in the upper levels of religious law and religious customs, which suggests to us that maybe John and Peter and along with them, their brothers, Andrew and James, it seems like maybe they had a very limited education, which would have been consistent with the people of Galilee. Uh, they didn't need as much of a rigorous education because really it was the people down in Judea who usually went into the law and went into stuff like that, whereas the people in Galilee usually just went into their trades. And so what they would do is they would just be schooled up until the age of like 12 or 13, and then they would just go into their trades. Unless they showed a lot of potential, then they would go off to something else and they would have advanced schooling. Peter, John, James, Andrew, all of them, they seem like maybe they did not do that and they just went immediately into their trade around ages 12 or 13. They had the basic education and then moved on. When it comes to his language, it is most likely that John spoke Aramaic. Uh, and that's because that was the common language at that time period. But it's also likely that he understood Greek and Hebrew as well, which is the case with pretty much all the disciples. Not all of them, but pretty much all of them. Like I said, there might be exceptions in the future. Stick around for those videos and find out. Uh, we have one reason to think that he would have understood Greek is first and foremost because he wrote books of the Bible. I mean, if he is the one who hand wrote uh, 
the Gospel of John, he had to at least know a little bit of Greek. If he wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and Revelation, he had to have known Greek. I mean, it is potential and it is possible that he dictated it to somebody else and they wrote it down. But it seems like he at least had familiarity with Greek, and that would have made sense. It would have made sense being a fisherman, right? Because you would have had to actually know Greek to be a fisherman in Galilee, because that's how you had to conduct business. There were a lot of non-Jewish people living there, and they would have spoken Greek because Koine Greek was the common language at that time period. Koine literally means common, so it was the common Greek. It was the common tongue of that time. But he would have also probably known Hebrew as well, because biblical Hebrew would have been necessary if you wanted to study the scriptures. And so he probably was fluent in Aramaic, probably knew some Greek, may have been fluent in it as well. Uh, and then he also was probably at least somewhat familiar with Hebrew. Maybe not fluent in it, but enough to read the scriptures and study the law and whatnot. When it comes to his occupation, he was a fisherman, kind of like all the disciples we've talked about so far. Jesus was very fond of picking fishermen because I think there was a good metaphor going on there. Uh, and there's certain character traits about fishermen that would have had to have been uh, up in the forefront if you were wanting to be a good apostle, right? You had to be able to go out there and put your life at stake. And you had to be willing to count the cost and do all that stuff, which fishermen would have had to do every single day. Uh, but he was a fisherman, much like all the other disciples, you know, Peter, James... John, Andrew, all of them were fishermen. Some of the others might have also been fishermen as well. We'll talk about that when we get there. Uh, but he was a fisherman, and we actually have that stated clearly in the call narratives of each of these guys. One other thing that we did mention when we talked about Big James is that it is possible that James and John came from a wealthy family. And we have two reasons to think this. First off, whenever Jesus calls James and John, it mentions that they leave their father with his hired servants. Which might suggest that Zebedee was more well off and that he was actually a wealthier fisherman who actually had a bunch of people in his employ. We don't necessarily know whether this is implying that. It could just be that he was a regular fisherman who also had hired servants. But it does seem to suggest that possibly he was a little bit wealthier just because fishermen wouldn't necessarily have been wealthy enough to have servants in the first place, right? So Zebedee very possibly was a wealthier person. Uh, who had a fishing business, a fishing enterprise, and he hired people to be fishermen for him, including James and John, his sons. They would have gone to the trade, learned from their father. They would have been under his employ. Possibly Simon and Andrew, they might have also been under his employ. And then whenever they left, Zebedee lost four servants. <laughs> uh, but then they left him with the hired servants, right? So he at least had other people to take care of his stuff. In this way, that would actually make sense. It would mean that Jesus wasn't asking them to just abandon their duties, right? He's not like destroying Zebedee here because Zebedee has other hired servants who could keep fishing. Uh, Jesus is actually just take, asking them to leave one thing and go do another, right? So it's possible that he is from a wealthy family. And this is re-emphasized in John chapter 18, uh, and this goes back once again to whether or not John is the beloved disciple. Because in John chapter 18, we have Peter who uh, finally turns around to follow Jesus. Basically, all the disciples have fled whenever Jesus gets arrested. Peter turns around and it says that Peter and another disciple went to follow Jesus into the, uh, into the um, courtyard of the high priest, right? Where they were going to watch his trial. And it says that the other disciple was familiar to the high priest, and so he gained entrance, and then he was able to gain access for Peter as well. And so this tells us that whoever this other disciple is, he might not even be the beloved disciple, he might not even be one of the twelve, he could just be some other random guy. But we have good reason to think that maybe it is the beloved disciple, and it is John himself. But whoever this guy is, he was well known enough to gain entrance for not only himself, but also for Peter. And he was well known to the high priest, the high priest being literally like the celebrity of ancient Israel, right? This is the guy who literally ran all the religious stuff at that time period. And so whoever this disciple was, he was well known to the high priest, which might suggest that he came from a wealthy family. If this is the author John or the apostle John, well, then there you go. So it's possible he came from a wealthy family. We don't know for sure, but that all being said, I don't want you to think that every single one of the apostles was a poor person. Some of them were, some of them were not. When we get to Matthew, we'll see that he most likely was not poor at all. Uh, prior to following Jesus, at least. <laughs> about how was he followed afterwards? We'll see about that. But yeah, so it's possible that John and James came from a wealthier family, uh, but we can't say that for sure. Moving on, let's talk about John and Jesus being cousins, because this is where we get the discussion about John's mother, Salome, if that is her name. 
Like I said, if you want the in-depth um, summary of all this, you can go to the Big James video, and I spend a long time on this. For this, I'm just going to go a lot quicker just so that we can move on and we can kind of wrap up this video by talking about John's character. But very briefly, we have to ask the question, who were the women present at the cross? This is where we're going to determine whether or not John's, parent, uh, John's mother's name was Salome and whether or not she was related to Mary, the mother of Jesus. Because basically, in the Gospels, we have these different lists of women who were present during the events of Christ's passion. We have people at the cross, people at the burial, people at the empty tomb, and each of the different Gospels gives us different lists. Matthew, Mark, and John, they give us lists at the cross. Matthew, Mark, and Luke give us lists at the burial. And then Matthew, Mark, and Luke give us lists at the empty tomb. And what you'll notice right here is that we have the mother of the sons of Zebedee who is identified as being at the cross of Jesus. So our question is, who is this woman right here? Is she the same person as Salome and is she the same person as Jesus' mother's sister? Right? And so we have to narrow this down. First off, we see Mary Magdalene's in the entire list, so it's not her. We see that Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, is, is in the same list here. So we know that, um, that the mother of the sons of Zebedee cannot be either of these two people. And so, in all the future lists, we can mark them out. We know that's not the same person because they appear in the same list in Matthew's account. Moving on, we can ask another question, right? We see women present at the cross, and we have to ask, who is the mother of the sons of Zebedee now? So we know who's present at the cross. We have to ask, who is this specific woman right here? And we're going to talk about what we know and what we don't know. First off, what we know is this. We know that Mary Magdalene is not the mother of the sons of Zebedee because, like I said, she appears in the same list that Matthew provides. Therefore, you can cross out Mary here. You can cross out Mary here. That narrows things down for us. We also know that Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, is not the mother of the sons of Zebedee because she also appears in this list. So you can cross her out here as well. The question becomes whether or not this person is the same as this person, which is what we'll get to in just a second. But thirdly, we know that Mary, the mother of Jesus, is not equal to the mother of the sons of Zebedee. And that's because we already know that Jesus did have other siblings that are mentioned in the Gospels. If you're a Catholic, you might have a slightly different view of that. But we do know that Jesus' mother is mentioned as having other kids and their names are identified, and it's not James and John, and we also have no mention of Mary Magdalene ever, I mean, um, we never have a mention of Jesus' mother getting remarried to a man named Zebedee, right? And so, since we know that James and John's dad was Zebedee, and we know that Mary, as far as we know, never got remarried to a guy named Zebedee, and she didn't have kids named that, we have good reason to think that James and John were not Jesus' brothers, and so we can cross out Jesus' mother as well. That means that we're listing these people out right here, and we've kind of narrowed it down to these two people. Is the mother of the sons of Zebedee Salome? And is Salome Jesus' mother's sister? Or is the mother of the sons of Zebedee Mary, wife of Clopas? That's what we're going to have to wrestle with right here. What we don't know for sure is if Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, is Mary, wife of Clopas. You might be inclined to think this since all their names are Mary, but what we have to keep in mind is that the Gospels do tell us that there were other women present and we also know from history that Mary was literally the single most common name at that time period. That's why there are so many Marys in the Gospel accounts, because it was such a popular, popular name. And so we don't know whether these two are the same person or not. We, we just can't say for sure. It's very possible, in which case, if this were true, then we know that the father of James and Joseph would be Clopas. We actually know a lot more about their family. We just don't know for sure. Moving on, we don't know if the mother of the sons of Zebedee is Salome, and this once again goes to the fact that we don't know whether or not there were more people present here. Uh, we do have reason to think that there were four people here, which would suggest that these lists aren't full, but it's also possible that Jesus' mother's sister is the same as Mary, wife of Clopas. And if you go read John chapter 19, you'll see what I mean there. We can't tell if John is saying that there are three people here or four people here. Whether or not he's saying that Jesus' mother's sister is Mary, wife of Clopas, or not. Thirdly, we don't know whether or not Salome is Mary, uh, Mother Mary's sister, right? We don't know for sure because it is always possible, like I said, that these two are sisters. The only reason I would seem to think that that is not the case is because it'd be very odd for both Mother Mary and Mary, wife of Clopas, to be sisters because their names are both Mary. That'd be very strange for a parent to be like, hey, your name's Mary and your name's Mary. That'd be kind of odd for two sisters to have the same exact name. So that's why I'm inclined to think that John's actually listing four people here, not just three. And so we don't know whether or not these are the same people, but we might have reason to think so. 
And then, fourthly, the thing we don't know is whether or not there were additional women. The Gospels do tell us that at different points there were other women here, but are Matthew, Mark, and John here talking about the same woman? We don't know for sure. And that's why we can't be definitive about this stuff, but we can say this. If one through three are correct, then that means that Salome is equal to Mother Mary's sister, which would mean that Mother Mary's sister is also equal to James and John, and that would mean that James and John are Jesus' cousins, right? Because if these three things are true, that means that Mary Magdalene, she's marked out, Mary, mother of James and Joseph is the same as Mary, wife of Clopas. We know that Jesus' mother is not in the, like, she's not even an option here. And that means that you're only left with one option, in which case all these three are the same people. Some people will speak a lot more dogmatically about this than I'm willing to. I'm not totally sure whether or not this is true, but it's interesting to consider, right? This might actually influence how we understand the Gospels a little bit, if it's true. It's nothing crucial, but it could tell us that maybe James and John were more familiar with Jesus growing up than we actually knew. Maybe they actually met Jesus prior to the events described in the Gospels. We don't know, but it's possible that they could have very well been cousins. Some people will say this very dogmatically, and that's actually why I wanted to spend time talking about this stuff. Uh, you might think that this is pointless, but my goal in these videos is to basically give you everything we can know about these apostles. And so if there's people who are out there dogmatically saying something about the apostles, I want to address those issues. And I want to say, I want to work through whether or not we have reason to think those things are true. Cause I want you to be able to basically come to this and get an exhaustive resource on what we know and don't know about the apostles. So I'll address the theory. I'll admit that it is very plausible. And I would actually say very likely but we just can't know for sure. And so I would say, hold this at like a 60%, right? It's 60% possible that John and Jesus were cousins, that James and Jesus were cousins, uh, but we don't know. Actually, I wouldn't even say 60%, right? I'd say it is as plausible as not, to borrow a term from Sean McDowell, who I've been referencing in a lot of these videos. Uh, it's as plausible as not. Maybe they were cousins, maybe they weren't. It really doesn't affect anything. Uh, but it is an interesting theory to consider. Just don't get obsessed with speculations and stuff like that, of course. Uh, but there you go. There's basically, that's how we walk through it all. Once again, I'm sorry that so much of this is so scholarly. I don't want this to be purely educational. But sometimes you got to work through this stuff if you're trying to be as exhaustive as possible. Let's move on. Let's talk about how old John was. This is something we've been doing in every single one of these videos. We've been talking about how old the apostles might or might not have been. And this is something that I do enjoy speculating about. We don't know for sure, but we do have some internal evidence that might suggest certain things to us. And the majority of this will be the same information, but we do actually have a little bit more information about John that might suggest stuff to his age. Uh, in regards to his age than we do it with some of the other apostles. And so first and foremost, how old were the disciples in general? First off, we know that Jesus was around 30 years old when he began his ministry, and this was the typical age of a rabbi. Uh, if you go back to my Simon Peter video, I actually read um, this one um, early, oh, what's the word? Early tradition, early, um, Oh my gosh, something from that time period. I, I read a text from that time period that was describing the different stages of life. And it says that 30 was the average age that somebody began teaching. And the Gospels tell us that Jesus started teaching around the age of 30. We don't know if that was 27 or 33, but we know he was around the age of 30. And that was in accordance with the culture of that time period. And so we know that in regards to ages, Jesus isn't exactly bucking the norm. We also know that the students were usually younger than the rabbis, and Jesus even refers to the 12 as little children. So this would suggest to us that the 12 disciples were younger than 30 years old because Jesus, as around 30, is calling them little children. This might suggest that they're actually well younger than 30 because it'd be kind of weird if a 30-year-old is calling a 29-year-old little child. <laughs> uh, we also know that education ended between ages 12 and 15, and some disciples were already practicing their traits. We saw this with James and John. They were already working with their father Zebedee. And so now we've got 30 as the top gap, and then we got on the bottom, we got between the ages of 12 and 13, right? Because they're already out of school, they're already working their trade, but they're under the age of 30. So we're in between 12 and 30 now. As far as we know, by the third year of Jesus' ministry, Simon Peter was the only member of the Twelve who had to pay the temple tax, which began at age 20. We don't have this explicitly stated in Scripture, but we do have this incident where some people come up to Peter and they say, do you and your master pay the tax? And Peter and Jesus are the only one who have to pay it. It could be possible that the other disciples weren't around, but more than likely, it's the fact that Peter and Jesus were the only two disciples over the age of 20 
at that time period. And that means, since this is the third year of Jesus' ministry, now we can bump back the eldest age of the disciples to 17 by the end of Jesus' ministry. So now, we're between 12 and 17, and it would seem, well, they'd be 17 by the time they followed Jesus, right? Because by the time, by the third year, they would have to be under 20. And so this means that at the time of following Jesus, most of the disciples had to be probably between the ages of 12 and 17. Moving on, the 12 often acted in manners more fitting of younger people. I mean, that's just... You go read the disciple. Uh, you go read the Gospels, and you'll pick up on that. I mean, that's something that I had never considered. But once I considered the fact that the disciples might be younger, a lot of the texts, a lot of the stories, actually started making a lot more sense to me. There were some things that the apostles used to do, and I'd be like, "What are you doing, man?" And then I considered that they were younger, and I was like, "Oh." That makes a lot more sense, actually. Uh, then, it appears that James and John were still living with their father at the time they began following Jesus, which seems to imply that they were unmarried at the time, and the average age of marriage was 18. Like I mentioned earlier in this video, Peter's the only one that we know for a fact was married at this time period, so it seems like he was for sure over 18. We don't know about the other disciples, but it, it is consistent, right? So Peter's at least 18 by the time he begins following Jesus, and that means he's at least 20 three years later because he'd be at least 21, right? So he'd be paying the tax. But it seems like the other disciples might have been younger than that, first off, because they might not have been married. But with James and John in specific, it seems like they were still living with their father, right? They were working with him, and they actually left him, which seems to suggest that they were still underage. They weren't quite at the marriage age, which once again gives us that 12 to 17 range. James and John's mother still seems to have a fair amount of influence over their lives. We've talked about this story a few times in these videos, but uh, there's this incident where James, James and John's mother actually approaches Jesus and starts trying to see if she can get her kids a good spot in the kingdom once Jesus establishes it. And in a way, she actually comes across kind of like a... Uh, not really just a mother, but more like a helicopter mom where she's like following them around and traveling with Jesus and everything, kind of watching out for her kids and trying to, you know, help them out and try to get them that straight A and stuff like that. Uh, and so it does seem like maybe they were younger and maybe that's one of the reasons why their mom was traveling with them. I don't know. Maybe they're, maybe Zebedee traveled too. I have no idea. Um, also, just in case you're wondering, the fact that their mother traveled with them might also suggest that they were wealthier because it does seem like some of the women who followed Jesus were wealthier women who were able to provide for the ministry. The fact that James is usually listed first might suggest that John was the younger of the two, right? Uh, it never says that they were twins or anything, so we have reason to think that maybe one was older, one was younger. And so, if we're at a 12 to 17 range, it might suggest that maybe John was the younger of the two, so we can say maybe 12 to 16 at least, maybe at least a year younger. Once again, this is speculation. It's not essential. It doesn't change anything in the Gospels. I'm just trying to be exhaustive, and I'm trying to frame these people in such a way that you can picture them whenever you read the Gospels. Lastly, this is actually the thing that we know about John that really helps seal the deal. John wrote the book of Revelation. Uh, that's what we traditionally believe, and that's what it seems like the author of Revelation intends for us to believe. John wrote the book of Revelation, which seems to have been written near the end of the first century, about 60 to 70 years after Christ's ministry. And church fathers from the early second century report having been his disciples, right? So there's two things here. First off, the book of Revelation seems to have been written near the end of the first century, around A.D. 96, right? And so if Jesus ministered around A.D. 30, this would be 66 years later. And so this means that whoever this disciple was, he had to live that long. And then we also have people who were alive in the beginning of the second century, such as Irenaeus, who was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of John, uh, and then we also have people like a guy named Papias who claimed to be a disciple of John, living at the beginning of the second century. And so that means that John had to live long enough to disciple somebody who was alive and kicking at the beginning of the second century. This seems to suggest to us that John must have been relatively young when he started following Jesus because he seems to have well beyond outlived the average age of that time period. I believe the average, time, uh, the average lifespan was actually 20 years at that time, but just to clarify things, I, I believe the reason why is because the mortality rate was so high. So really, uh, most people died before the age of five, but if you made it past five years old, I believe the average lifespan was supposed to be like 40 to 50 years long, right? So you actually lived up to like 40 or 50 years old, so it wasn't really that, like, I mean, it's bad compared to nowadays, but uh, I probably should be citing a source here, so <laughs> don't get this wrong. But I believe it was between like 40 and 50 years old was the average uh, lifespan for somebody who wasn't like wealthy. If you're wealthier, you could live a little bit longer, a little bit longer. But this actually is consistent with the Gospel of John, because whenever Peter asks Jesus whether or not 
the beloved disciple will die. Uh, Jesus says, what is it to you? What if I want him to live until I come back? What's that matter to you? And then it says that a rumor began to spread that this apostle would not die, which means that at the time that the author is writing the Gospel of John, people have begun to wonder whether or not he would die, which means that he's been alive for a while, well beyond the average time span. But this also would seem to suggest to us the fact that he lived 60 to 70 years after Christ's ministry that might suggest that he was well younger than the other disciples and he might have been a fairly young guy when he began following Jesus. Which also might be a reason why he was the disciple whom Jesus loved, right? If he was the youngest guy, that could be reason to think that. And so, let's get to some conclusions. Most of the disciples were likely young teenagers at the time they began following Christ. And John, in specific, was likely a young teenager at the time he began following Christ. He was probably 12 to 15 years old. This is just... You know, it's just a healthy guess, but I think it's very, very plausible. I would say that maybe he was 13 to 14. Uh, it seems like maybe he might have just gotten out of school. You know, he was uneducated. He'd gotten into his trade. And maybe shortly after that, Jesus began, Jesus came and called him. And another reason we'd have to think this is because it does seem like John was following John the Baptist for a little bit, right? John was actually a disciple of John the Baptist. This would make sense if he had just gotten out of school. He went and followed John the Baptist for a bit. And then he met Jesus. He hung out with Jesus for a bit. Then he left and he went and participated in his father's trade for a bit. And then Jesus officially calls him, right? So we can actually kind of develop a rough chronology if we understand that John would have been a younger disciple. This actually makes a whole lot of sense. And then you can see how even at 12 to 15, he would have still lived into his like 70s or 80s until the end of his life, right? And so that would be very well beyond the average life expectancy for somebody from Galilee. That's for sure. And so, there you go. Once again, this is speculation. We don't know this for sure, but I do like to talk about it because this is information that we can glean from Scripture, right? But let's move on and let's talk about John's character. This is the thing we're going to wrap up on today, but we're going to spend quite some time on it because this is where we actually get to dive into Scripture, right? This is the stuff I've been trying to build us to because I just like talking about Scripture, right? This other stuff, the scholarly stuff, it's fine. It's fun to discuss, Scripture is the main thing I like talking about. That is where I just, I could eat it up all day. I love Scripture. I love God's Word. That's what I want to talk about. And so we're going to spend some time on John's character just because I think it's uh, it's important to talk about because it'll frame our idea of this apostle. And what we can do with John is we can split him into two categories. We can talk about young John and we can talk about older John. And that's because it seems like John undergoes a radical character shift during his time of following Jesus. And so we're going to start off by looking at young John as he appears in the Gospels, right? So this could be young teenage John. And then we'll talk about older John as he appears in the book of Acts, as well as the epistles and in Revelation. Because it seems like we do actually get to see how this person develops over the course of his life. And it's actually really, really unique. Young John is going to come across appearing much like a teenager. Um, whereas older John, we're going to see that he is mature. We're still going to see some of those teenagerish elements, maybe. Um, but we're going to see that he's grown up and that he has matured a lot in that he spent his formative years with Christ. First thing that we can say about young John is that he was proud and self-seeking. A lot of these are going to be very similar to his brother because, like I mentioned, James and John usually appear right next to one another in the gospel accounts. And so a lot of what we know about young John comes from stuff that he shared with his brother, and they are both very proud and self-seeking. And for this, we're going to look to Mark chapter 10. I read both of these accounts in James's video. I read the Matthew account and the Mark account, but for our sake today, I'm just going to read the Mark account. And we read this. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him, him being Jesus, and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism of which I am to be baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And so we see... James and John don't come across looking very good in this account. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, but in Matthew's account, this is actually their mother who starts this conversation. James and John are still very involved. But we see that they are seeking to be elevated 
uh, in their status. They're seeking a title from Jesus. And this is something that Jesus frowns upon. Jesus does not like people seeking to advance themselves in such a way. Uh, I mean, what God wants of us is he wants us to have the mindset of John the Baptist, right? He must increase, I must decrease. We should be seeking to lift up Jesus, even if it means decreasing ourselves. We need to be like David dancing through the streets of Jerusalem, saying that I'll become more undignified than this, right? May we become undignified if that's what it takes to glorify God. Uh, but John and James do not come across in this way. Uh, they are not humble and they are not selfless. They come up to Jesus and they say, Jesus, grant us what we request of you. Right? They are bold enough to ask the king of kings if he will grant them anything they ask. And he says, what do you want? And they say, let us sit at your right and left hand. Uh, they're wanting to be second and third in charge in the kingdom. Right? They want to be his second in commands. And Jesus says, are you able to drink the cup I'm going to drink? Uh, and he's alluding to his death. Right? He's alluding to his suffering and his death. And boldly and cockily, they say, we are able to. Right? Uh, you would probably think that they would question that, but they don't have any idea that the the Messiah is going to die, right? I mean, he's probably told them that at this point. I don't know if he has yet. Um, I'd have to look at the Gospels, but they don't, even if he has told them, we read time and time again that they didn't understand it, they didn't believe it. They didn't believe that the Messiah was going to die. That just was like beyond the realm of possibility for them. And so he says, are you able to drink the cup I'm going to drink? And they probably think like, yeah, we'll go to battle with you. We can do that. They don't realize that he's saying he's going to suffer and die. And so they say, we're able to do it. And he says, you will then. And so it seems like he promises that they either will suffer or even possibly die. With Big James, we know for a fact that he did die for his faith because that is recounted in scripture. Uh, but these guys, they don't come across looking very good in this story. They look pretty proud. They look pretty self-seeking. They are looking to advance themselves. And we even see that the rest of the apostles got really frustrated with them because of this event. Uh, in the verses that follow, the disciples like are mad. <laughs> They're like, what the heck, guys? What are you doing? Uh, so James and John, they don't look good here. They're very proud, self-seeking. They, they are a lot like kids. Once again, if you imagine these guys as being teenagers, it actually makes a lot of sense. I think we do this nowadays as adults as well, but especially young kids, right? This is like the person sucking up to the teacher. This is the person who's like kind of the teacher's pet who just wants to be up front. We talked about how Simon also came across like a teacher's pet sometimes. Uh, but with James and John, it's like a, they, they don't even seem to be aware of what they're asking. Uh, their mother is the one who kind of asks it for them, right? Which once again, suggests they might be younger, but th these guys, they're just like, if you just thought about this, that's not a wise thing to ask. Like, you, it's just a, I don't know. Uh, it kind of reminds me of season two, episode two of The Chosen, whenever Peter's like walking up to Jesus and being like, hey, I'm just saying we should establish a formalized structure and maybe I could be in charge. <laughs> like, it comes across looking really bad. It does not look good for these guys. And so we don't get a very good image of these guys looking like holy saints, right? One doesn't simply drift into holiness. You need to spend some time with Jesus if you want to end up there. And I think that's a lesson for all of us, right? Because I think I, I see plenty of myself in these guys. Uh, moving on, we see that they are both impetuous and zealous. Uh, and we see this in Luke chapter 9. And this is the incident where we're talking about the Samaritans and James and John desiring to cast fire down from the heavens. We read this. But the people did not receive him. This is the Samaritans, right? So the Samaritans did not receive Jesus because his face was set towards Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. So we see that James and John, they see the Samaritans not receiving Jesus. And this makes them very, very mad uh, because they're like, whoa, nobody should be treating Jesus in this way. And they turn to Jesus and they say, hey, let us call down fire from heaven to consume them. I don't know about you, but if you know anything about the character of Jesus, you would know immediately this is not what he wants you to do. It seems like, once again, these are guys who are picturing the Messiah as like a authority, like a, a conquering king who's coming in to destroy people who are opposed to God, and they don't like the Samaritans. They think that the Samaritans are opposed to God because of their religious beliefs. They do not like that the Samaritans are not receiving Jesus. They get mad, and they think that this is what Jesus wants. So you see their impetuousness because this is nearing the end of Jesus' ministry. And by now, they should know Jesus' character, right? At this point, Jesus would have preached the Sermon on the Mount, and he would have probably taught them those teachings to go out and teach to others. So they should know Jesus would not be about this. Yet for some reason, they still suggest it. This tells us that, yes, they were very zealous. They really cared about Jesus being honored. But at the same time, they were very impulsive and impetuous. They didn't understand exactly what Jesus wanted. Once again, very childlike in how they're acting, or childish, really. 
They're also very loud and boisterous, and I don't really need to quote anything here other than to reference Mark 3.17. He named them Boanerges, the Sons of Thunder, right? Uh, this might be a reference to the story we just read, but at the very least, to be called the Sons of Thunder would seem to suggest that they were not quiet. <laughs> they were probably very loud. They were very out in the front, and I think the gospel seemed to support that. A lot of the times, James and John's are they're coming up, and they're suggesting stuff that's very extreme, and yeah, so we get the idea that this is who they were. They were proud, impetuous, loud, self-seeking, zealous, boisterous. These guys, very, very immature. This is the picture we get of them in the Gospels, and a lot of the times we kind of overlook this, but a lot of the apostles don't look that good in the Gospels, and to me, I think that's actually evidence for the validity of Scripture and the truth of Scripture, because the people who are writing this stuff, they're not trying to make themselves look good. Right? If I was Peter, I would totally leave out the story about me denying Jesus. If I was John, I would definitely tell people to not mention that time I wanted to call down fire on the Samaritans. I would leave it out. I would tell people not to. But instead, the Gospels accurately record this stuff, and it records people authentically. It tells us the good things. It tells us the blemishes as well. And so we get to see that these guys, they're not the best but they followed Jesus, and that's what mattered. And that's why it's going to be really cool when we look at older John, because we're going to see how Jesus took these negative traits and he turned them into positive ones. We also could see that James, uh, that John specifically, that he could be intolerant and narrow-minded sometimes. Uh, in Mark chapter 9, this is actually the one occurrence where we actually read about John apart from his brother James. Uh, I do believe in Luke's account that it says that James and John both were speaking here. And notice that... This account right here comes immediately before the account of the Samaritans in the fire. And so really both of these stories combined with one another in Luke, they serve to just paint James and John as not looking very good. But when you go to Mark's account, in Mark chapter 9, we read this. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Uh, and so this is one of those weird teachings of Jesus that seems to contradict one of his other ones, but if you examine the context of them, they're not contradictory at all. That's just something that skeptics bring up because Jesus says in one place, whoever's not for us is against us. Um, and then another place he says, whoever's not against us is for us. And you're like, wait a second, what? Uh, those seem contradictory, but they're not. Go study it on your own. Uh, but right here we do get the picture that John maybe a bit intolerant, narrow-minded, right? He sees this person, and the person's casting out demons in the name of Jesus, and G John's like, um, we don't like this guy, right? Uh, we actually tried to stop him. This person's doing a good thing, right? This person, they're, I mean, we don't know for a fact whether he was a follower of Jesus or not, but at the very least, he believed that Jesus' name had power, and he was doing things by the authority of Jesus, and he was attempting to cast out demons, uh, and apparently he was being pretty successful, uh, and rather than praising God that God would allow this man to be able to do this, John actually rebukes him and is trying to get him to stop. And he goes to Jesus and he's like, you know, Jesus, I tried to tell this guy to stop because he wasn't traveling around with us. He wasn't following us. He wasn't in our group. And Jesus is like, why? Uh, it seems like John kind of had this snobbish attitude about being in the 12 or being in the disciples who were following Jesus. There might have been more than 12 disciples following Jesus, right? Just 12 were the apostles. And so it seems like John might have been a bit narrow-minded there, right? He was, we also see kind of the pride coming out as well because he's like, ah, they're not in our group, therefore they can't be doing this stuff. It's like he wanted to be able to cast out the demons he didn't want anybody else to. Uh, he was kind of wanting it all for himself. That's not a very good look for this guy. So, uh, sorry, John, not looking good once again. But here's a positive thing. Right? Uh, I don't want to just list out negative things about young John because there are reasons that Jesus chose him. Right, it's not He didn't just choose him just to show just how much he could do. There were certain character traits about the Apostle John that really do serve to highlight that he was an amazing individual, right? And that he was a good guy and that he had something to offer Jesus, right? And I think that's the case with everybody. And to be fair, these stories I'm about to talk about, these show up near the end of Jesus' ministry. Um, but we do see that John was a committed and responsible disciple, perhaps more committed and responsible than any of the others. Uh, and first off, that's in John chapter 18, in the incident we were talking about earlier, where it seems like he is the disciple who turns around with Peter and goes and follows Jesus into the trial, right? None of the other disciples did that, but it seems like Peter is the leader, and so he goes with John, and John seems to be faithful there. But then we get to John chapter 19, and what we read in verses 26 and 27 is that John is going to be the only disciple 
of all the 12 who is present with Jesus at the cross, or so it would seem. Uh, and once again, this does hinge on whether or not John is the beloved disciple. But I, like I said, I think we have reason to believe he is. And he's the only one present there. In John chapter 19, we read this. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to his disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. And so right here, we have Jesus turning to John. And John seems to be the only disciple who is present at the cross. And he says to John, Take care of my mother. And he says to his mother, Look, here's your son. There's a whole discussion that we had there why Jesus didn't give his mother to any of his other brothers. That's presumably because they weren't there. <laughs> because they didn't exactly follow Jesus. But, um, yeah. So, we get this idea that John's committed, right? Uh, it'd be dangerous to be present at this cross. Because why did all the disciples flee? They fled because they were afraid of dying, right? They were afraid that they might face the same fate as Jesus. But John doubled back. And he stuck with Jesus to the end. And he was there when Jesus died. That's commitment. But he was also responsible because Jesus was willing to entrust his own mother to John. Obviously, Jesus was going to resurrect and he was going to come back and stuff. But he was only going to be here for a little while. And so from this moment on, John takes Mary into his own household and takes care of her. And we actually have tradition that talks about this as well. And so it seems like John did have a certain level of responsibility that Jesus knew he could entrust to him. And so that's really cool, right? Yes, he was proud. Yes, he was impetuous. Yes, he was loud. Yes, he was intolerant. But we all have got stuff like that. The cool thing is that he was committed to Jesus and that he could be counted on to do the things that Jesus asked him to do. That's what's necessary, right? You can have whatever baggage that you come to Jesus with, right? Jesus asks you to come just as you are. All he requires of you is to be committed to him and to do what he says, right? Be committed to him and be accountable, right? If he asks you to do something, go do it. That's all Jesus asks. He can handle all the negative stuff. He'll reshape those things. All he needs is that commitment from you and that reliability. That's what John had. That's really cool. One last thing that we see of young John is that he's very quick to act. Fast forward to the third day after the last story. Jesus has been dead, right? He died on Friday. He was dead on Saturday. And now on the third day, the tomb is empty. Mary Magdalene goes and visits it with some other women, and then she rushes back. And this is what we read. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to him, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out of the and so Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. When we talked about Peter, we talked about how he was a very quick-to-act person. John was quicker. <laughs> you might have seen this joke multiple times throughout The Chosen, but uh, there's this running joke that Peter's not a very fast runner. And we see that in John chapter 20, because uh, it's not that Peter wasn't necessarily as excited as John. It just seems to, su seem that, uh, it seems to suggest that maybe the Apostle John just wanted to mention that he got there first. I don't know. There might be a theological reason for that. Maybe one day if we ever walk through the Gospels, we can actually talk about it. Uh, but we know that John is the first apostle to arrive at the empty tomb, right? Peter and John, they arise, they get up, they run to the tomb, and John gets there first. But interestingly enough, John doesn't immediately go in. It's almost like he's afraid of what he's going to see. Peter, on the other hand, shows up a little bit later and he blasts right in because that's just Peter's character. But John holds back and it seems like he's a little more thoughtful now. Maybe he's grown a bit, right? He's like, ooh, I'm afraid of what I'm going to see in here. We might have actually seen him grow a bit. I'm, I'm not totally sure what to make of that. I, I've always pondered about why he didn't immediately go in. But Peter does. Uh, but we do see here that John's very quick to act as soon as they hear things. They don't go tell the other disciples. They just get up and they blast down, right? They're running through the streets. They're running all the way to the tomb. John gets there first, uh, which means he's just running fast. And um, yeah, so we do. that's a good thing too, I think. Uh, it, it could be impulsive, but... He sees something's wrong and he immediately takes action. I think that's a valuable trait in a disciple of Jesus. Let's move on to older John and then we'll wrap this up. And if, if this hasn't really been your type of video, please come back for the second one. Because the second one, we're going to actually start walking through the life of John. And that to me is the stuff I'm most excited for because that's where we actually just get to walk through scripture even more. I mean, we're walking through it a lot now. Um, but if all, in all honesty, I'm just kind of exhausted from going through all that scholarly stuff. And so my brain's kind of on like half power right now. But um, 
the next video I'm really excited to talk about the actual life of John and walk through his story. And so please come back for that one because if any, like honestly the second video in this series is probably going to be the most significant of all of them because really the third one is mainly just going to be addressing the traditions about the Apostle John that we get after the Bible. Uh, but yeah, come for the next one because I'm really excited for that. But let's talk about old John real quick and then we'll wrap this bad boy up so I can go get some sleep because I've got a long homework day tomorrow. Alright, so, Old John, what do we know about Old John's character? I believe I have another six traits to list. First off, we know that he is grateful and indebted to Christ's grace. And rather than reading any passages here, I'm going to reference once again that he's called the disciple whom Jesus loved. These are the, all the references of where he's called that. And this goes back to what we talked about at the beginning of this video. Right? What does it mean to be the disciple whom Jesus loved? It means that he recognizes how much he doesn't deserve that love. Right, it's not him boasting. It's not him saying that Jesus loved him more than the most than the rest. It's just him realizing he doesn't deserve it. And whenever he views, looks at it, he says, "I'm the disciple of Jesus loved." Right, I, I, I'm the beloved disciple uh, because that's how he's got to view himself because he realizes how much he doesn't like he doesn't deserve it. Uh, and so I think that's something that definitely comes out in the um, in the Gospel of John. The fact that he would even call himself that, I think that testifies to what older John was like. Uh, because you don't see that love coming out of young John here. But now older John writing his gospel, he can't help but mention that he's the disciple whom Jesus loved. And so you get to see how he's indebted to the grace that Jesus showed him through all of this stuff. Whenever he came in and he was asking for a spot at Jesus' right hand, Jesus showed him grace. Whenever he asked to cast down fire on the Samaritans, Jesus showed him grace. Whenever he said that he rebuked a guy for casting out demons in Jesus' name, Jesus showed him grace, right? Again and again, Jesus showed him grace upon grace upon grace. And you get this picture by the title that John gives himself. You get this picture that he's so grateful to Jesus for what he's done. And that's why he's motivated to write his gospel in the first place. And that's why in John chapter 20, he says that these things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and so that you may have life in his name. Because John is so enamored by what Jesus has done that he can't help by sh but share it with everybody else. And he wants everybody else to know that same love because Jesus said, they will know you are my disciples by your love. A new commandment I give, love one another as I have loved you. Right? John heard these words at the Last Supper and he took them to heart and he said, I'm going to share this with everybody. I'm the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's amazing. He's grateful. He's indebted to Jesus' grace. And I think all of us should be this way. He was also very loving and gracious. This is why he's called the Apostle of Love. I said he was called the Beloved Apostle for reasons beyond just calling himself that. Uh, but he's called the Apostle of Love because the word love appears more in the Gospel of John than in any of the other Gospels combined, right? So take Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Take all the times that you use the word love. Add them all up. That will be less than the amount of times the word love is used in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is all about love, and the same thing is true of his epistles as well. If you go to 1 John, basically 1 John is just a commentary on the Last Supper discourse. Like, basically, 1 John is a commentary on John chapter 13 through 17, which is all about love. And so both of them are all about love. John is the one who says that God is love, a phrase that is very abused nowadays, and maybe we'll be able to address that sometime. Uh, but John's the one who says that God is love. He understands love, and that's why he's called the Apostle of Love, because he understood what it meant to be loved by Jesus. And as a result of knowing that love, he was able to love others well. And so what I thought I'd do is I would actually read from 1 John chapter 4, because this is where we get him talking about God being love. John says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does, anyone who does not love, does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Does this sound like the same proud, impetuous kid that we met in the Gospels? No, 
He's grown. This is the disciple whom Jesus loved, who recognizes that he doesn't deserve that love. And he's so grateful to the grace that Jesus has shown him that he can in turn be loving and gracious to others. That's why he said, in this is love. This is how we know love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. That's where love comes from, right? You have to receive God's love first in order to understand how to love. And until you taste the grace of God, until you taste and see that the Lord is good, until you understand that you don't deserve God's love, but that he gives it, you cannot love somebody else. You have to know God's love first. Any other type of love, I don't care how you define the word, if you define the word love in some way that is in any way separated from the love of God towards us, that is not love. That is something vastly different. The only way to truly know love is by first understanding God's love towards humanity. That's necessary because you get to see that his love is sacrificial, it's gracious, it's selfless, it's giving. That's what love is. And so we have to understand that, and that's how we love others. People define love nowadays in the weirdest and wackiest of ways, and I cannot stand how much they abuse this amazing thing that God's given. But they talk about love in a way that is very self-seeking and sensual and feelings-based and just self-focused, uh, and it's fleeting, and it's just no good. That's not biblical love. Biblical love is sacrificial and gracious and loving, and it's a direct outpouring of God's love towards us. John, he experienced that grace again and again and again. That's why he calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. And that's why we know him as the apostle of love. Because he knew God's love well, he was able to love well. And that's why whenever you read the stuff he wrote, you cannot help but learn about the love of God. And that's why he can say God is love, because he understood that. Moving on, we see that old John is very passionate about the truth. We're going to see this whenever we get to the traditions about John. He was very, very, very passionate about the truth. Uh, but one thing that we know about this as well is that the word truth appears in the Gospel of John more often than all the other Gospels combined as well. right? So not only does the word love appear in his Gospel more, but the word truth does as well. There's a lot... Uh, John is a very thematic book. He's got certain key themes that he repeats over and over and over again. There's like light and darkness, day and night, love, spirit, truth, all these different things. There's a lot of themes throughout the Gospel of John. And so not only does love appear more in his Gospel than all the other Gospels combined, but so does the word truth. And that's because he's very, very passionate about the truth. In 3 John, right now we're going out of the Gospel of John and moving into the epistles. In 3 John, verses 3 and 4, we read this. For I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. So this is elderly John. He's probably writing around A.D. 90 something, probably A.D. 90 to 95, right? He's old. He's like in his 80s or 70s, something like that at this point. He's writing and he says that he takes no greater joy than to see his children walking in the truth. And by children, he means children in the faith, right? So those who he has taught to follow Christ, he takes no greater joy than seeing them walking in the truth. And that's because he was very passionate about the truth. John MacArthur says this, John's zeal for the truth shaped the way he wrote. Of all the writers of the New Testament, he is the most black and white in his thinking. He thinks and writes in absolutes. He deals with certainties. Everything is cut and dried with him. There aren't many gray areas in his teaching because he tends to state things in unqualified, antithetical language. This is actually something I've been noticing because, once again, I've been reading 1 John lately in my daily Bible reading. And it's funny if you compare John and Paul, for instance, because John, like John MacArthur said here, he um, he's very black and white with everything, right? It's this or that, and there's no in-between. Whereas Paul... He, he puts a lot of gray areas and everything, right? He's like, oh, all things are lawful, but not all is permissible, right? So it's very interesting because it seems like John is giving you the basic building blocks and he's giving you a much simpler theology, whereas Paul is pointing out the complexities of it. And so it seems like Paul, his main focus is on helping you grow in Christ and with growth comes the complexity but John's main focus is helping you keep that childlike faith because there's something pure about how children see things, right? They see things as very black and white. And in some ways, seeing that black and white makes decisions a lot simpler. Children aren't always correct, but there's something to that, right? And 
the way I could best describe it is that maybe whenever you read the writings of John, he keeps your focus on the goal, right? If you like, if you this is the metaphor of running a race, John keeps your eyes on the goal. Paul teaches you how to navigate the path, right? So Paul is teaching you how to navigate through the gray areas of life. John is teaching you the black and white that you keep keep your eyes on. Don't follow the darkness, pursue the light. Don't fall into falsehood, pursue the truth. John's keeping it black and white. He's he's looking at the big picture stuff. And then Paul is zooming in and he's teaching you how to navigate it more personally, right? Uh, and I actually think that's cool because you need both sides of it. You need to grow in Christ, but you need to maintain that childlike faith. You need to maintain the simplicity and not get lost in the complexity. Because sometimes you can just start thinking only like... Um, I'm not saying only like Paul, because I think that Paul understood the stuff that John did as well. It's just a different writing style, a different in emphasis, difference in emphasis. But I think a lot of the times, as we grow in Christ, we make everything too complex and we lose that simplicity. Uh, but to me, one of the most refreshing things to do is to return to the simplicity. One of my favorite things uh, that I used to go do is I work at a church and that church has like a... Um, a private school attached to it. And sometimes I used to go sit in on the preschool chapel, right? The chapel that they preach for little four-year-olds. Uh, and I used to love sitting there because there was something refreshing about seeing the Bible taught in such simple manners. Like just, just, just simple lessons that weren't complex. Like I'm in seminary right now and sometimes you just get off in the weeds talking about the most random and complex stuff. And it's just kind of confusing sometimes. But sitting there, listening to these four-year-olds learn about God and hearing the simplicity of it it was refreshing because it reminded you, you know, there is, there are simple truths that you need to keep in mind. And sometimes as we grow, we lose sight of those things. And we start focusing on all the different fringe areas of stuff that make life so complicated. And we're like, oh God, I don't know what your will is. And I'm trying to figure it out when really, I mean, sometimes that is valid, but sometimes if you zoom out and you just think about the big picture, you'll know without a doubt what God's will is. Sometimes we just get so in our heads that we lose sight of that. And that's the beauty of John's writing is that he's passionate about the truth. And because he's so passionate, he actually is very focused on the black and white areas of things. So if you go read the Gospel of John, or if you read his epistles, or if you read Revelation, you'll get a very black and white presentation of the world. If you go read Paul's stuff, it'll be much more complex and nuanced because he's admitting that there is nuance to stuff. And you need to acknowledge that as well. Uh, you need to hold both in tension, right? You need to have the balance, uh, Not you need to hold the tension between complexity and simplicity in every decision you make. You need to keep your eyes on the goal, but learning how to wisely travel that path. And so I think that's a really cool thing we learn about older John. Shaped by all the things that he encountered with Jesus here, he learned to be very passionate about the truth because that is something that Jesus put into him, right? I mean, in John chapter, what is it, 8, he says... Jesus says to the disciples, if you want to be my disciples, you need to abide in my word. Because if you do so, you'll abide in the truth and the truth will set you free. So Jesus is all about teaching about the truth. And John picked up on that. John's like, okay, cool. Jesus is passionate about the truth. I'm going to be passionate about the truth. Go to John chapter 4. Jesus says, if you want to worship, it's got to be in spirit and in truth. And so John's very, very passionate about that. That's why he's so black and white about things. And so if you're comparing the writings of Paul and John, you'll be very shocked at how vastly different they are. Uh, but they're both necessary for the Christian walk. Moving on, John proved to be very faithful and bold. And this really, I put old John here, but this guy right here, Acts chapter 3 and 4, this isn't too far away from this guy. Because Acts chapter 3 and 4, this is the very founding of the church, right? I mean, Acts chapter 1, Jesus ascends. They appoint another person to replace Judas. Acts chapter 2, Pentecost, the Spirit descends. Peter preached his first sermon. Acts chapter 3 and 4, we have Peter and John going throughout the temple. They're preaching. They heal a lame man. They start getting questioned by the religious council. And what we see is that John is very faithful and bold boldly proclaiming the word of God, even whenever they tell him to stop, he still goes and he still preaches the word. Acts chapter 4, we read this. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. I'm not going to go on my whole rant about this passage like I did when I was talking about Simon Peter in those videos. But one thing I just want you to notice is that these are the guys who about a month and a half earlier had abandoned Jesus, right? Whenever he was arrested, they fled. 
And then ultimately, they did double back, and they went in, and they followed Jesus into the trial. They watched that, and Peter left again, but John stick, stuck around. But we get to see how much they've grown. In just a month and a half, these guys are boldly standing before the very people who had Jesus killed, and they're proclaiming Jesus. That's amazing. They realize that, like, they realize that they are putting their lives on the line by doing this, but they do it. And so that looks really good. That's a very good characteristic of John. And notice that all these things, these are things that we all want to embody in our own lives. That's why I spend so much time on these, because it's a testimony to what Jesus can do with us, right? He took this proud, self-seeking numbskull up here, and he turned him into this grateful, loving, passionate about the truth, faithful person that John turned into. That gives me hope, right? That gives me a lot of hope that God can take somebody so proud and arrogant and just a jerk and can turn him into something so loving and gracious because i see a lot of pride and arrogance in myself a lot Uh, i see times where i can be more gracious to others and it motivates me to know that by spending time with god and growing in him we can become people like this older john that's very encouraging to me that's why i spend so much time talking about the characters here uh, because it's it's cool to see how jesus shapes people that's why testimonies are so moving to us We also see that John is very reliable and authoritative. Uh, We see that his reliability did not change, right? There are certain positive traits that he displayed during the Gospels that he continues to display later on. Uh, We see that he was an authority in the early church and that he was considered reliable. And this is because Paul calls him a pillar. We read this in Galatians chapter 2, starting in verse 7. On the contrary, when they saw that I, I being Paul, when they saw that Paul had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. Paul's just saying people perceive that Paul was basically an apostle to the Gentiles, just like Peter was to the Jews, and that's because the Spirit of God was working through both of them. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the un, uh, and they to the circumcised. Right. So basically, it seems like Paul is describing this agreement that they had with um, James, Peter, and John. It's uh, Paul was traveling around with Barnabas at this time period. Uh, there ends up being kind of a little rift between them a little bit later on. But at the time in Galatians, he's talking about how him and Barnabas were traveling and they eventually went down to Jerusalem. Or actually, I think in this point, they're in Antioch. I don't know. But he talks about how he talked with Peter and stuff like that. And whenever they met up, he met with Peter, who is also named Cephas. They met with James, not to be confused with the brother of John, but actually Jesus' brother James. Uh, it seems like the brother of John was dead by this point. So we have Peter... James, the brother of Jesus, and then we have John, and Paul describes these people as pillars of the church, right? They were the lead authorities, and they were the main people that you could rely on. That's what the idea of pillar is, right? It's somebody who holds the foundation, it holds the ceiling up. He holds everything together. That's what they're doing here, Uh, and Peter, James, and John were the pillars, right? Those were the inner three. uh, It's ironic that it's Peter, James, and John, right? Because Peter, James, and John were the inner three of Jesus' disciples, but now one James has been traded out for another Uh, But these three were the pillars of the early church, uh, and John was amongst those. And so he was still reliable, just like he was to Jesus at the cross. And then, last but not least, sorry if I've been stumbling over my words in these last ones. My brain is just kind of like fizzing out right now. (laughs) Uh, But we also get to see that John was a very balanced and zealous person. And what I mean by that, uh, you'll see in just a second. In 2 John, verses 4 through 11, we read this. I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing uh, you a new commandment, but the one we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may in full re- but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. And so it's interesting here because... 
the type of love that John's talking about here is very countercultural to what we talk about as love today, because in one moment he's saying, hey, I want you to love one another because that's a sign that Christ is dwelling in us. At the very next moment, he's saying, if somebody shows up and they are teaching something contrary to the gospel of God, I don't want you to let them into your house. I don't want you letting them stay in your house. I don't want you staying anywhere near them because if you show them hospitality, you are participating in their wicked works. Whoa. Uh, but that's because John understands love according to the biblical idea of love, which is seeking the best interest of another person. And if you encourage them to continue in falsehood, you're not loving them. So what we see here is that's why I put that John is a very balanced and zealous person. He's balanced because he knows how to maintain that tension between love and truth. They tie perfectly together, right? You have to preach the truth. You have to love well. These things aren't contradictory, but according to our cultural definitions of both truth and love, they are contradictory because our culture has taken both of these two things and have vastly, vastly distorted them. John knows that these things are compatible and that they're actually perfectly intertwined. You cannot love without the truth and you cannot speak the truth without love. Those things are totally tied together. And so I think the way that I want to wrap up this video today is I want to encourage you to go read John's stuff, right? I mean, I still got a few more videos we're going on here. We still got like two more weeks just covering the Apostle John. And so maybe before we even go to this stuff, I'm going to encourage you to go open up your Bibles and read the Gospel of John. Read 1st, 2nd, or 3rd John. Read Revelation. Get an idea of who this guy is because I think it's some. I think he's got a message that is vastly needed in our current culture. Our culture knows nothing of love. Our culture knows nothing of truth. We live in this world where people say love is love and they don't mean the same things when they say either of those words right? Um, they say love is love and it's not the biblical idea of love. They talk about love in these weird ways. I mean, even Hallmark, I mean, those movies are addicting. I'll, I'll be the first to admit it, but that's not love. That is not love. Most of the romantic comedies you watch, it's not love. We don't know what love is in our culture. And then we live in this culture where people talk about truth and it's like your truth, my truth, their truth, everybody's truth. Everybody has their own different truth. We live in this postmodern culture where truth is like not a thing. And so I think that we can really benefit from studying John's work and getting that balanced yet zealous approach to love and truth, where we can hold those two side by side and we can walk through our life with an accurate understanding of both. And so that's why I included this one last, because I think that that's an important lesson for us. These other, I mean, really all these are lessons for us. This is a very encouraging list right here because you get to see how Jesus took this kid and turned him into this amazing, reliable pillar of the early Christian church. And we should learn to try to apply all of these things in our lives. But specifically this last one, I think that this is the one that our culture is in most need of. I think this is the first thing, like if we're going to reform the church and help the church be what it needs to be, I think we need to reclaim love and truth. I think those are the two things that are most necessary um, right now. And I don't see enough people talking about it. I see people here and there addressing the fact that our culture has messed it up, but I don't see us doing enough to change that. And so I'm going to encourage you, go open your Bible, go dive into John's work, study these things, allow yourself to soak in the simplicity of the black and white stuff he's got to talk about. We live in this world that wants everything to be too complex, and maybe we need some of that simplicity to kind of retrain our minds and reestablish that childlike faith. And so go read this stuff. Go study it and see if we can reclaim love and truth according to God's definition of those words. I think that's very, very crucial biblically. I think it's very crucial culturally. And I think it's also very crucial in our own personal lives. And so that all being said, we're going to wrap up this video. Oh, I accidentally spoke. We're going to talk about John the Gospels next. <laughs> but I'm going to wrap us up there. And with that, I'm actually going to pray for us again before we actually wrap up this video. Um, once again, I apologize if I was all over the place today. I don't know if it came across that way. I certainly felt all over the place. I think I'm just kind of tired. And so I'm going to go and probably go, go to sleep. <laughs> it's a little bit late at the time I'm filming this. Uh, but thank you so much. If you actually hung through with this, thank you so much. And thank you for being gracious to me. I appreciate that. I can't guarantee it, but I will try to make sure that I am not all over the place in the next video. Uh, but... Let me pray for us real quick, just so that we can try to leave here in a way that is uh, truly just focused on the Lord. All right. Lord, thank you so much for your servant, John. Thank you for appointing him to be an apostle. And I pray that we will have learned from his life. 
Uh, I pray that even a single one of my words reached the ears of those who are watching and that they didn't just soak in this information, but that maybe in some way they were drawn to pursue you more. Because that's my goal in making these videos, God, and if that's not what's being achieved, then I don't want to make the videos. I want people to fall in love with you, God. And if that's happening, let me know so that I can continue to encourage people in that way. As we continue in our studies of these apostles, I pray that you will guide our hearts closer to you so that we aren't just soaking this information, God, but that we are truly using it for your glory. And I pray that we'll share this with our friends so that they will also grow in their relation with you and their understanding of your word. Because there are so many books out there we could study, but none of them are worth studying like the 66 books you gave us in your holy scriptures. We love you, God. We thank you for everything you have done. We thank you for your son that you sent to save us. Let us not take the salvation for granted. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. Well, I will check with y'all later. Please be sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell, share this with your family, share this with your friends, share this with your neighbor, share this with the person you don't know just sitting across from you at Starbucks. Share it with everybody. Uh, it'll really help benefit this channel. And the more you comment on it and the more you like it, that also benefits the channel and lets people know that this is good content. So I would appreciate that as well. Uh, if you haven't checked out the other videos in this playlist, you can go do so. We've got four other videos already on there. And... Who knows, by the time you're watching this, we might have more that come after this. And so be sure to check those out as well. Uh, but thank you so much. I always appreciate y'all watching this. I know these are long videos. And so the fact that you'd sit through me talking, honestly, is the greatest compliment you could give me because I get tired of my own voice. And so thank you so much for that. I look forward to interacting with y'all in the comments. Please be sure to uh, comment in there. And uh, if I got anything wrong, please be sure to challenge me on that. And uh, just like, let me know because I like hearing where I got stuff wrong as well so I can correct it in the future. But thank you so much. I appreciate every single one of you. God bless. Be sure to keep a smile on your face. Don't let anybody steal your joy. I'm going to go get some sleep. My name's David. This is Now Let's Be Honest About Movies. I'll check y'all later. Bye-bye. So hear me, God, deliver me when sin my heart does see. For you are mighty and pure strong but my flesh is oh so weak